time to start. <laughs> so thanks for joining my opening session of the ELC. Uh, I speak about upstreaming, unique upstreaming. So uh, I'm, part for, I'm part of the Lino uh, Qualcomm, Qualcomm ecosystem team. So we mainly um, our work is to upstream and maintain uh, Qualcomm SOC in mainline Linux and now Reboot. So our mainly job is to port and make sure drivers and SOC books boot uh, well on the mainline Linux. Uh, I'm also a maintainer of a uh, multiple subsystem in Linux and Reboot, so mainly AMLogic SOCs and uh, DRM wide page and panels. And um, I've been focused on Linux kernel of streaming uh, for the like, uh, eight, like, uh, last eight years. So I have a bunch of, bunch of patches in Reboot and Linux. So a word on Linaro. So Linaro uh, is, for the last uh, 14 years, uh, has been dedicated to make sure um, uh, the, f the whole uh, open source software is running correctly in ARM SOCs, uh, which is today quite the case. So it's not uh, finished, we still uh, work on it, and you know, works with companies to make sure product works fine on ARM, uh, on ARM SOCs. So uh, I already did the talk eight years ago, so I basically uh, full based the talk on today's situation, which is the same, but still different. Uh, if you want to see the slides uh, and the video of my last talk, it's available on the internet, so it will make a diff if you want. <laughs> um, so there's still, there's still notable changes, um, so I'll probably highlight the difference. So the agenda. So it's mainly a set of questions you've answered. I know most of you know the answer, but it's still great to refresh and think about why upstreaming is important, uh, mainly on Linux and Reboot. Uh, so the first question, why upstreaming? Uh, why should we do much effort, even if our uh, Linux product is working fine? I mean, so, Yes, we should, Man, and before upstreaming, the companies should make sure the code is available, the code is in a Git repo with history, uh, clean code that can build, uh, that can probably generate something bootable, and yeah, they should make sure the code is upstreamable and push the code upstream, and we say should have an upstream workflow, so it should be the closest possible to mainline Linux. So this is important and not is not still a norm. It's getting better and better each year. It was not the case eight years ago for a lot of companies, so it's getting better, so it's positive. So there's a plenty of vendors that participate a lot in upstream, so uh, I'm happy to put Qualcomm in the list today because it was not in the list yet uh, eight years ago. Uh, and yeah, I can cross this image forever now. <laughs> and now I'm happy because I can boot a normal distro on Qualcomm SOC, Qualcomm boards, even the last test, even the, the board I have streamed uh, know, two months ago, which is great. And yeah, there's a good list of the main uh, vendors that are actually working on mainline Linux, which is uh, really great. So for the top contributors, you can see the list of companies I just listed, and Linaro is in the, in the top for the 6.8. Um, mainly you can see the Linaro employees, which I, I highlighted, and you can see uh, other employees of the, these main SOC vendors who actively work towards having a good maintenance support for the for ARM SOC which is really great and much better than eight years ago. So what companies does upstreaming? I mean, because it's not only SOC vendors who does the work. There's OC IP vendors, uh, service companies like Linaro, uh, Bailey, Benicon Mix, or, or Collabora, or Bootlin. Uh, there's 
ODM, board makers, and distributions, functioners like uh, uh, Red Hat, uh, SUSE, and so on. Uh, so it's a, a whole ecosystem, and every company should participate because it impacts every every part of the chain completely. So for the SFC members, it's uh, quite complex because the costs are really high to actually make an SOC. Uh, they've lo lo got a lot of legal issues to actually uh, make the documentation public, especially for IPs they buy. Uh, so mainly the IP vendor doesn't, are not very collaborative on this side, so it's the main problem. Um, but there's a lot of SOC members that really participate, like ST, who actually start upstreaming with public members years before announcing the product. I mean, for the last MP2, they started upstreaming like three or four years ago. They just announced a few months ago the, the SOC. Uh, and so they had a full upstream chain when announcing the product. So it, it's really super awesome. So it's a good example, a very good example. Uh, the whole industry should actually follow. Um, but they have a lot of customers, a lot of product, like the, the most is the smartphones. When you have a smartphone that are sell at multi-million devices, you can't randomly change the kernel, so you have a stable kernels, and somehow old kernels when they start the product. Uh, so there's still some synchronization with uh, mainland kernel. So in the last years, uh, we've seen a lot of synchronization of the last LTS kernel. So probably the GKI, GKI uh, strategy, which probably uh, forces the vendors to use the last, STI, last, STI, last LTS uh, for the new SOCs. So it's still better than using the old uh, 3.x kernels and we had uh, eight years ago. Uh, the IP vendors are part of the, of the ecosystem and they almost never upstream. So we have some upstreaming from Cadence and Synopsys, uh, which is really limited when you see the catalog. I mean, they only maintain like two or three IPs and they have like, they have, like thousands of IPs. Uh, and they often, make a lot of money on drivers actually, so they don't really care about upstreaming because it's a lot loss of money. And most of the IPs, we can directly communicate with it. It's often behind firmwares or, or often the register interface is different because it's part of the, about, uh, the integration to, have a, to define the, um, the register interface. So it's particularly true for video decoders, for example where uh, it's starting to change now uh, because uh, it's important to have correct video decoding and the IP vendors starting to participate in the streaming. So it's, uh, it's a good change. Uh, board makers try to participate, but they focus mainly on making the board and trying to help customers using the board with the whole capacity of the board, and it's not easy for them to use uh, mainland Linux, which has less features. It's hard to sell, it's hard to, to explain to the customer. Uh, so there's still, there's still a lot of upstreaming from them to, to at least support the board uh, with the actual SOC support in the mainline. Um, and yeah, sometimes the uh, ODM don't provide the kernel source because they only provide the Android build. So it's quite it's like in the middle, uh, when you make a board and sell boards, uh, it's not easy to, to upstream, but yeah, it's possible. I mean, we had uh, like a Libre Computer, which does full mainlining from the beginning. So for them, we can boot Debian, Red, or, or any Red Hat distribution directly on the board without any, uh, any change. So it's possible, I mean, uh, can do this. So why it is so important after all? So the, the will question is here. So the why it's important is mainly for new features. So you don't have to redevelop everything each time and try to 
backport zillions of patches, but the most important feature are the, uh, are the bug fix, the security fixes, fixes and the security features. Uh, and we see today it's the three last points are the most important. Uh, we should really make sure the, the Linux product we have run with the latest stable kernels because we find a lot of bug fixes and security fixes and this should be the priority of the Linux vendor. So today the situation has really changed. Most of the products use up-to-date, the base of not up-to-date uh, stable release. So this should be really important. But the, the new features uh, should be also uh, really important because the way we manage the features, the way we handle the, the devices, we get enhancements every day on mainland Linux and you can really have performance enhancements uh, when using uh, an up-to-date mainland kernel. So even if you're not okay, I mean, you should upstream code, it's, it's simple as that. And not only Linux, any, any open source uh, project. So, I know making a product is complex enough. I mean, we, we all know uh, it can take years before having a, a stable product uh, on a Linux or any, any kernel, in fact. So why upstreaming it? So um, code maintenance, mainly. Uh, fair return, because you, you use a product which I was, that, that was developed for the last uh, 25, no, 30 years. Um, and if you want to make sure the Linux platform, the Linux project is still alive in a few years, you need to make, make sure it's still alive, so you need to participate in it. Uh, so unlike eight years ago, we have now a product running very close to mainline Linux, which was wasn't, wasn't, was not the case eight years ago. So it's, uh, it's good, we need, to, we need to, to speak about it. Um, we can now, run near mainline or mainline on uh, products we can buy. So this is great. Uh, so for the code, man code maintenance, uh, when, you, uh, when you develop Linux, when you maintain Linux, you are constantly trying to optimize, rework, and change the API. It's not to make uh, people uh, angry. I mean, it's, uh <laughs> it's really to make sure uh, we remove dead code, we remove outdated code and things that don't work anymore or that are too complex to make sure uh, we can add a new driver support. And, and when you have your code mainline, you will be part of the, of the process. You will have your API uh, change uh, done automatically. It's part of the, of the design. Uh, and when you update your kernel, you don't, don't, find, don't want need to test every single release to make sure your driver still works. It will simply build and you only need to test it works actually. Uh, and you only have to have a proper uh, CI test suite to test every kernel release uh, to make sure your driver still work on your platform. Because without this, you will need to test a lot more and revise manually and uh, check manually if you use a white API. So just you gain time and you gain money uh, doing, doing that. So for that, you need to have a, a good upstream workflow. Uh, and having a good upstream workflow can really optimize how you actually handle your, your uh, upstream and uh, downstream code. Uh, you can have multiple ways to, man to maintain your, your BSPs based on main and Linux. So yeah, the old one is to have a BSP tree which is based on an old kernel and you almost never synchronize. Uh, you can have a, um, a way where you regularly rebase on the latest LTS. And the other way is to actually rebase at each version and to have a really close as possible at mainline because you, all, you always have some downstream, downstream changes. It's part of the, you cannot, cannot upstream everything. It's impossible. You still have some changes, some tweaks, some uh, product and specific changes you can upstream. So 
if you upstream most as possible, you will still need to rebase each every release, but it will lower your 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 work. So this is the classic fashion uh, where BSPs are handled. So you basically you have a, a vendor a BSP tree that uh, is based on the old kernel, and it will always stay on this old kernel, probably rebased on the stable kernel, but uh, you only they, most of the vendors only take a new kernel uh, when you have say, a new feature, for example, and they never rebase the old BSP, but still maintain the mutable versions. This is the basic way uh, of doing this. Uh, it's, it works because you have a stable BSP, uh, but the problem is at each time you start a new version of the BSP, you need to revise a lot of stuff because there's a lot of difference between the two uh, major kernel versions. Uh, and you will still need to backport features between the branches and uh, you will have a kind of lot of work to make sure the features are, are correctly balanced be between the versions. So this is the most optimal uh, way to, to maintain the BSP, uh, is to have uh, a BSP that is always close to the last uh, stable version, for example. And the, the, to make this workflow work, you need actually to push almost everything upstream and only keep the downstream challenge at minimal. So you have the closest possible to the kernel uh, and with this, we can have uh, really uh, a clean and uh, easy to port uh, BSP. Uh, the problem is you need to maintain a, a separate team for upstreaming. You cannot, do, you cannot mix the team that develop the BSP and maintain the main line. So, uh, I mean, there's plenty of ways to organize your, ma your main line workflow, your product. Uh, but this is mainly the most op optimal way. So how long does it take to upstream code? I mean, it can be easy, <laughs> but yeah, it's complex. There's no easy answers, and it's not only on Linux. It's only it's on all, I mean, open source projects. Uh, most of the maintainers are not paid, uh, or it's only in the part time. So you cannot have a consistent time to mainline, um, uh, time to mainline, and you need to understand correctly the development cycle of, of all projects and like Linux as well, and you need to be able to easily rework and refactor the code to make sure you're got upstream because mo some of the, the contributors don't understand they need to rework their code, they need, they need to match the maintainer's way to maintain the code and to organize the code. And depending on the subsystem, uh, it can be long, it can be short, it can be complex. Uh, some, sub some maintainers will tell you, oh, okay, I merge it, just send me another patch to fix this. Some maintainers will take like three years because they will check every single line. So it depends on the maintainer of the subsystem and the actually driver and you, 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 you submit. So, uh, for example, when you have uh, huge changes that affect multiple uh, subsystems, for example, the main workflow is to push simple patches after one other to make sure uh, it goes in the right subsystem and match the correct uh, maintainer's view. And the idea is to, at the end of the streaming, you push an atomic patch set that enables the feature, which is spread among the kernel. So it is mainly true when you have uh, uh, SOC support, when you have DT, DT will be the atomic last uh, commit when everything else is merged. So there is no really methodology or method documented to do that. Uh, and you need to know the maintainers, you need to know uh, people, you need to discuss with them to understand which is the most optimal way to push your code uh, upstream. 
so time to mainline, uh, it can be long. Uh, and when it's done in one release, it's awesome. It's rare, but uh, you can do it. Uh, when you push the initial platform support, it can be very frustrating because there's a lot of dependencies. Uh, you push code almost uh, on over multiple subsystems. So you need to be prepared to have a failure and wait two or three releases to have code merged. For the merge delays, so the main reasons you can have to have delays. So the most, the, the number one is the code style. Uh, and code style, because code style is really dependent of the subsystem. I mean, <laughs> between the network and the like input, you have different code style. Uh, you don't, don't use the same uh, variable. You don't organize the same way uh, the variables are ordered. The, the ordering of the in include are different between DRM and network and input and so on. You need, to <laughs> you need a lot of experience to, to pre prepare your code to match the subsystem style. And you can even have uh, contradictory uh, reviews. So <laughs> You need to balance between both reviews and take the better one. Or, yeah. So it's a lot of work and there's a lot of knowledge to know. Um, there's bindings, uh, bindings that need to be clean and tested. Uh, this is new. This is new. Like the few, a few years ago, now it's mandatory you know, to have uh, correct uh, bindings um, which are tested and uh, you need to have your device tree, which has no more, uh, which is fully tested against buildings to be merged. So it's not a hard requirement yet because we're still in the process of cleaning the device trees, the buildings, but it will happen someday. Um, the merge delays can be dependencies on headers and binding headers. Uh, for example, uh, the DT and the code doesn't go in the same tree. So if you have like clock drivers with bindings and headers, uh, you will ever need to have both maintainers within DT and clock to make a common tree or wait two releases to have the clock merge first and the DT merge after. So it depends which SOC you're targeting if the maintainer of the DT is active or not, if it, he, he knows the clock, correct is the clock maintainer, if he's able to make shared tree or not. And sometimes you part of the, you, you, you push code between a, a, a rework. So this is the worst situation. Like you, there is a work like on a clock subsystem or whatever, and you try to push a new driver and you need to match somehow in the middle of the, tra the transition, and you need to heavily use the Linux Next, for example, because you have the final uh, work which is done, and you need to, yeah. so it's quite complex. And one of the last issue is posting code too, too early is not reviewed or too late. So you need to push at the right time, and some maintainers are really picky about that. Not after, not not before RC one, not before after RC RC RC, RC four for review. So you need a lot. There's need a lot of experience to understand the complexity of uh, the maintainer's uh, point of view. So for the delays, for example, uh, for the for the SOC for the basic SOC, you need almost two two or three kernel versions to to have something merge. For a simple driver, uh, it can be a few weeks. And for the more complex driver, like a, a Joe driver, a DRM driver, it can be one or two months if there is enough reviewers uh, and the maintainer is active. Uh, but yeah, we should be prepared to have to iterate over multiple versions and rework the code a lot. For info, I, I tried to push a, a touch screen driver. It took me uh, almost one year to get merged. But yeah, so I'm, I'm experienced, but yeah, I didn't know the input system. And it took 
me a lot of time, too much time. I had to send 15 versions of the patch set. And it was fully reviewed at the f third version, but it took like 12 revisions to patch the, the maintainer's uh, point of view. So it can be complex, and even for experienced developers. So for the simple headless SOC, like for a network, uh, network platform, it can be like for one person, it can be like six to nine months, like one year to have something correctly working in mainline. But if we need, we need to upstream something for something uh, SOC very complex, with video, with bus scaling, with uh, DSPs and security, the minimal of one year and a half to multiple years. I mean, for Qualcomm SOC, we've been doing it for like 10, 10 years, and some SOC are not complete yet. Because some, some piece of hardware are really, that's so complex, it's hard to fit, and we need to add new uh, subsystems to handle the, the features. So a practical example. Uh, one example is uh, what I pushed uh, this uh, the end of last year. So I pushed support for the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3. SOC. Uh, so I posted all the patches the uh, day of uh, the official announcement. Uh, the patches, uh, I spent six months to prepare the patches. Uh, so they were ready uh, the, day, the day of the announcement. And 90% were pushed were merged for 6.8. So 90% uh, means uh, I had a boot to display in Linux Master at 6.8 because I knew uh, the state, uh, because the state of the Qualcomm upstream was so good, I was able to split my patch set in plenty of pieces, and I was able to atomically uh, end the, with DT. So everything was, there was almost no dependency. So the only two dependencies was uh, for the clock bindings, the clock header, and the interconnect header. But uh, since we know the, the, the interconnect maintainer did a shared tree, and since the, the clock maintainer is the same as the DT maintainer, it was done uh, by itself, so <laughs> it was simpler. But yeah, we were that, we were that I had to wait uh, another cycle only for clock and interconnect. And then I developed some features in between, and 90% of the new patches were also merged, and for 6.9, I'll, I'll, I'll have uh, uh, USB-C alt mode working, uh, GPU, no, GPU, not, not yet GPU, uh, all the DSP and audio working. So you can expect when you have a correct uh, ecosystem around you for not only code, but also reviewers and maintainers, you can expect 90% uh, of your patches to be merged but you need them to be correctly prepared uh, to match the, what expected for the, from the reviewers and the, main, the maintainers. Because I expect they often, they, the maintainers that apply patches do not actually participate to the review. So they need the patches to be fully reviewed and correctly in the good state at the end of the, before the main drive, like RC, at almost uh, between RC5 and RC6, RC6, they need to have the patches prepared. They need to be, they need to be correctly, they need, they need to apply on their tree uh, perfectly. And often then they don't like to, they, don't, they won't wait for a new version to be uh, applied. So, uh, so, the question is, uh, all Linux ports, uh, how hard is it to upstream? Uh, like if you have a very old, uh, old, uh, old uh, support. So when you start from a really, really old base port, like uh, 3.2 or 2.6, I mean, I've gone from there, uh, it's different. I mean, at the time, we had almost anything for ARM, everything for, was like Intel related. You had, the only generic stuff was uh, like UART, basically. <laughs> uh, 
So now uh, you have everything to support a modern SOC. Uh, you have pin control, GPU, uh, reset, DRM, SOC, uh, SOC for audio. And now you even can even validate the base tree. So it's, it's like magic. You can validate and test almost everything that can fit in subsystems, in frameworks. So it's a game changer, and most of the code can be uh, removed, and you only need to add the small bits to match the, the sub subsystem. So yes, it's hard, even for trained professionals. Uh, I've been doing Linux, many Linux for like 15 years, and I still, I still have some I still do some errors, I still do some typos, I still need to send 15 uh, <laughs> versions of the patch, patch to be merged. <laughs> so, but you're not alone. I mean, there's plenty of professionals that can help you, uh, like for training. Oh, sorry, I put free electrons. It's not free electrons anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> I should fix it. It's Bootlin now. I still have the old name in, in my head. So. You can be helped by training by Linux experts. There's a lot of small companies and big companies that can help you. Uh, they actively participate to the upstream community in U-Boot and Mainline. And you can work with community. Uh, I mean, they, a lot are open to discussions. They have a lot of RRC channels. Uh, you can have some, you have some new communities, like, like the one from Post Market OS. They use metrics. And there's a lot of discussions. So, so, it's an open, uh, it's, it's kind of open. There's a lot of open community to discuss. And I mean, yeah, so it's, it's, you're not alone. And what about the benefits? I mean, because your boss will need to have these answers. <laughs> so the benefits, uh, code quality, uh, maintenance cost, mainly. Uh, fastest, uh, I, didn't, I didn't add it, Fast, fastest um, code to mainline uh, um, time. Uh, you, can, you can use the open source strategy. I mean, if you have an open source strategy, something you can market, actually. It's now, today, it's um, something you can say to people, and it's something valuable. Uh, customers uh, will somehow prefer uh, a company that has a clear uh, open source strategy, a clear upstream strategy. Uh, and some markets, some, some markets uh, only uses mainline, or really close to mainline. So um, if you, have, you want to make some products in IoT, for example, some big customers only take mainline, or really close to mainline uh, associ uh, associates. And you can also hire uh, talented developers. I mean, some companies hire good developers because they have an uh, active and very good strategy on, on open source. And finally, money. I mean, it will cost less at the end. So <laughs> this is the, main, the main argument is money. Uh, you can reduce the long-term already cost. And you can have great talents. So it's two big arguments. So um, thank you for listening. Um, if you have some questions, I'd be happy to answer. Um, you can reach out uh, to my team and my team and uh, me and myself on IRC. Uh, I'm also on Mastodon, and you can visit linaro.org if you have some some questions on Linaro. Thank you. Don't have questions. I mean, you can you can finish now. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, I was maybe too much negative, but yeah, if you, I was really focused on SOC support, and and if you only target uh, drivers on some subsystems, you can iterate really easily. If you, if you need to be prepared and you have you need to have code correctly formatted and tested, yeah. So if you have a corrected formatted and tested code, it can really go fast and iterate only in one, many, only, many, someone, sometimes only one version of the patch that will go, and it's most of the time. So it was, yeah, I agree with you, I was maybe a bit, too, too bit negative, and um, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> So oh, yeah, thank you, thank you for listening.
check, check. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes, you can. All right. So why don't you love me back open source? So when I was writing this, uh, it was easy to write the title, <clears throat> but then as I was putting together these slides, I've asked myself multiple times why in the world I took this perspective and approach to the problem. But in the end, I managed to put it together. So let's see how it came together. So a couple of words about me and Linaro. Uh, I think you guys all know Linaro. I think it's uh, good to put things in perspective. Linaro was funded back in 2010. Uh, with the, uh, well, at that time, if you guys remember, ARM was trying to establish footprints in open source, kernel bootloader, tool chains, and such. And then each ARM licensees and silicon vendor, they were just going to the community and mainline projects with their own set of patches, which were conflicting one with each other. 
So Linaro was created and invented to kind of, you know, standardize and put an end to fragmentation of contributions. And so originally the mission and the charter was about collaborative engineering uh, for the ARM open source ecosystem. And then over time, Linaro added a developer services components, which is the part of Linaro uh, that has open source expertise that works with device makers uh, to build real products. So while Linaro original charter was all about collaborative engineering, uh, developer services is all about proliferation of open source and products. So we enable the ecosystem and we push products uh, that use open source that we build in the ecosystem. That's kind of the powwow and how we do that. And I'm a uh, director at developer services at Linaro. My name is Davide. And I think 80% of you know me already. So um, while I was doing this talk, I was researching the uh, seven stages, stages of every relationship. And if you believe it or believe it or not, it, this does apply to engineers as well. And more importantly, it does apply to hardware engineers as well, which is strange. We're all software engineer. We know hardware engineer don't feel, you know, as we do, but this applies to them as well. And uh, it's also funny enough that you can put those phases, those stages on the hype curve, which we've seen for other reasons and in other use cases, right? So the first of the seven stages being that of infatuation. The second being that of dating. The third stage is that of struggle. The fourth is that of disillusionment. The fifth being that of stability, commitment, and bliss. Yes, I, and many stops, many stop right there, right? Not many go for, you know, beyond this disillusionment phase, but if you can manage to, you can find stability, commitment, and bliss, right? which is another way to say I ignore the pain and, you know, I'm blessed for that. And if you were wondering, yes, this doesn't look pretty because I did draw this myself. So infatuation, that first look, right? At a friend's pizza and hacking party or the Linux Foundation or Linaro Connect conference or at an operating systems principles class Right? You get to see it, you get to see open source, you get to hear about that, you get to play a little with it, right? but that's enough. That's the initial sparkle right? that sparks curiosity. Right? Open source is built beautifully for this. So you just check open source out online. You see if you share the same interest with the open source projects that are out there. You want to see if you share the same passions. And I'm just using Zephyr and Yalta project as two examples, right? Right, so based on what you see, now you are encouraged, right, from this first feedback. Uh, documentation is readily available to you, right? And yes, these projects have a quite complicated website, which is a good sign, because they're open source project. Websites don't matter, documentation does, right? Uh, there's a vast library of manuals and targeting different personas, like what is the author project without a BSP developer's manual, right? right? Who cares about the user manual? I'm a BSP developer. If the BSP developer manual and guide is lacking, then I'm not even trying the project. Uh, there's a well documentation on functionalities. There's broad hardware support, although it wasn't the case 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Uh, there's a predictable release cadence and versioning. Uh, there's a compatibility program, right? The states whether or not what you do can be compatible with the projects that you want to leverage. And there are community channels and mailing lists. And there's no signs of RTFMs left. Those have been just wiped out clear. And there's industry backing. So this kind of ends the first phase from the first look to feeling encouraged that you want to move forward. So you do move forward, right? So you get going. I'm going to be using this get going a lot, right? To the point that it would be annoying, but I just use it here. And so I'm going to keep doing that, right? So you just clone the Yalta project repo and off you go to the dating phase. Okay. The first date is always virtual, right? In real life, we use Zoom 
during COVID pandemic, right? Or Google Meet uh, in the Zephyr or Yocto project world, or in general, us embedded software developers, we use QMU instead of Zoom. We like that better. Uh, there is a good selection of user space bundles, um, which Yato calls targets. You can build from a minimal uh, uh, user space to a fully feature user space. They boot into graphical mode, and then you can run the operating system directly on your host machine uh, running QMU. And it's cross architecture, so you can try ARM, Intel, even PowerPC. Even MIPS, if that's still a thing. Do we still have MIPS in Yato project? I don't remember. Huh. I can't remember either. Nobody uses MIPS anymore. Do we still have Broadcom MIPS routers out there? We had the Malta 4K at some point, remember? At any rate, yes. So you can try these instructions. Uh, I went by memory on the plane. Uh, this should be working, and the disclaimer is there because I know that each and every one of you will take the slides and try them and try to, you know, see if I was right or wrong. So feel free to try them, and then especially the echo command that reminds you that that could not work. Okay. So that's the first date. The second uh, date is physical, and uh, this is the RB5 from Qualcomm. It's a robotic high-end platform. Uh, with AI and vision, and it's supported by Meta Qualcomm, which is a layer that Qualcomm and Linaro maintains uh, jointly, uh, hosted at yachtoproject.org, Git repo. Um, so this is the set of instructions, and so again, the second part of the date is physical. You clone the Meta Qualcomm layer, and you add layer with the beatback layer command, and you change the machine, to Qualcomm RMB8, and you build a core image, uh, which is minimal, right? And this all goes smoothly. Right? So even the second date uh, works well. And the third uh, stage of the dating comes around. This is where you take open source to your friends, right? You've done virtual, you've done physical, and now it's you introduce to friends and family. Uh, you're bullish uh, thanks to the progress uh, that you've done real fast. You share your results, damn you, with coworkers and manager. A commitment is coming right there. And you talk about this with family and share your excitement. And then you stand firmly behind the proposal of using it in production. This is all based on infatuations and dating, right? So it's, it's fairly quick, right? Probably you are a couple of weeks into it and you are already ready to take it in production. All right, which is where the struggle comes. Because when you want to be serious, <laughs> it's about schedule requirements and expectations, just like in real life, right? So first of all, time pressure, because now that you stand firmly behind the decision of taking open source into production, uh, product launch date is set. So the time is uh, ticking. Uh, there's always limitations. There's always less hardware than we need. Right? We always need more, and that's why QMU was invent invented in first place, but you still need real hardware. And uh, there's issues with availability. Right? You had to work on boot time and usability requirements because this product has to be available most of the times, and it has to be responsive. Uh, Real-time response, video encoding and decoding, frame rate, video resolution, these are all things that you didn't have to care about uh, before moving into the production phase. Uh, there aren't constraints, just like in life, memory and storage. Our memory gets worse over time, right? That of physical hardware target is constrained by definitions because you, know, you can save money when you uh, ship millions of devices out there, right? One gigabyte saves money. And then there's people's demand, those application developers. They want the libraries, they want their SDKs, they want a lot of questions and how-tos, right? All of this is part of schedules, requirements, and expectation. That's the first part of the struggle, right? And this looks like you, right? Thinking maybe that was a smart choice. <laughs> maybe I should have waited a couple of weeks more before committing myself to productions, but no, who cares? You will power through 
Round one, target QMU, right? And for most of you, this is nil, right? So bear with me in the analogy. <laughs> Uh, so you branch off and you fork off and, and you just tell yourself that that's for some days, right? I'm going to merge back soon enough. And you pull additional drivers, packages, and libraries because, you know, the auto project, it doesn't support the world. There's, al there's always something outside of the auto project domain that you need. So those darn application developers need and they ask you. Uh, you train the package manifest and you remove the unnecessary software. Uh, there's two approaches here. You can start from the image which is minimal and add things on top, or you can start from the image that contains most of the things you need and just work your way down, right? So if you're in a hurry, the second approach is what most of the people choose, although the former approach would be better because you're more control of what gets into the file system of your target. So you start patching configuration files and code, you package it up in a separate layer, you export the SDK, the US image for the application developers, and you're good. So now the hardware comes, right? And it's a second round. So you try to rebase, right? Say that maybe four weeks have gone by, so you try to rebase everything. Remember, you branched, you wanna rebase and realign. And at this point, you might well succeed uh, with the author project releases, right? If there's a new one that became available in the meantime. And you do the same for all of the additional drivers and packages and libraries that you've collected uh, upstream, right? You have to rebase to the latest because it'd be silly not to do this otherwise uh, at this point of the project. Uh, you start adding off tree patches, things that didn't make sense to add in the QMU world. Now it does make sense to do so such as preempt RT patches, for instance. And you start measuring things, because uh, this is a real world. So you measure boot time, memory usage, you start me uh, measuring storage, uh, contest switch time, system responsiveness. Uh, you delay a bunch of services because you don't like how the system boots up, and you start pushing things uh, to later because you want to get to the prompt as soon as possible, right? It's back to responsiveness requirements. Uh, you start moving to modules, some of the uh, functionalities that were built into kernel, right? Again, this is to speed up the boot process. And you start changing process priorities or nice, right? To make sure that the services that you care for boot first uh, or take the necessary priority and they respond in time. Uh, you start running intensive benchmarking uh, and again, as you do all this, you're gonna start patching configuration files and code, package all back up in the layer that you just created. You update the SDK, the OS image, and you give it to the application developers. Okay, and that's the second part through struggle stage. And then round three, this is integration. So the applications are coming from application developers. You add them to the file system. You measure again, boot time, memory usage, contest switch system responsiveness. You delay other services that might be needed to delay, to change process priority, measure, measure the frame rate and resolution, run intensive benchmark again, fix regression, patch, 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 update SDK, OS image, and you're done. Are we done? No, we're not. Okay, because the only thing that we'd done was to move very quickly from infatuations to dating after a couple of weeks, committing to production. And given the time stress and pressure, we just decided to work our way and power it through. And we haven't followed any of the approaches that are best practices to make sure that this is production grade software and can be maintained later on, right? And this is where the disillusionment phase, uh, disillusionment phase, um, stage kick in, right? Because you got to pay your taxes, as they say. Uh, and in open source, I think, and in the software engineering, there's a nice term uh, that back at Intel, we used to call uh, the backpack. The backpack gets heavy. And by backpack, I mean the amount of code that has diverged from mainstream whether because you just stayed divergent for too long or because you started combining things together, right? Uh, the reality is that as this backpack gets uh, fuller 
it gets heavier, and the heavier it gets, right, the slower you are, right? You want to uh, uh, travel uh, light if you want to go far and fast, and that's not the case. And so uh, in software engineering, and in particular when it comes to open source and leveraging software that we haven't built in first place, managing the technical debt, it's something that we want to do since the first kiss. Right, that's very important, right? And you probably realize this is the second time around, the third time is around. Right, so the longer the separation lasts, uh, the higher the cost of ownership. And cost of ownership is a financial measure that you can measure um, the benefit of using any kind of software or technology. Um, uh, so tag and branch might be necessary, uh, but it's better if it's done closer to product shipment. And it is usually a trade-off between small increments of infield upgrades uh, or full upgrades. So at some point, you're going to have to follow mainstream until it's ready to ship. But then once you've shipped it, you have to track with updates because that, that code base is frozen until the cost of providing updates in field becomes higher than the cost of doing a full upgrade. And, and it's not rocket science, but as, you know, as soon as you are aware of that problem, then you start thinking about how do I plan for that in the future? How do I plan so that the technical debt is kept as, as small as possible? You're going to have it, right? It's going to be lumpy, right? But you don't want that to explode. You want to take it down when it's time, and then it's going to back up, and then you want to take it down, keep it contained. If you think about Yalta Project and the concept of a layer, make sure that that layer is as thin as possible for as long as possible. All right, so and there's a, I think a, a major uh, uh, mismatch of expectations, and we'll see that in the next phase, right? But open source is a train that keeps on chugging. Open source is about enabling innovation. Uh, uh, so new features and bug fixes and security fixes, they are always against latest. They're never against something that happened before. So the moment that you've frozen your code base, it is your own responsibility that to readapt, and that goes back to the technical debt. Um, so the same applies to CVEs and licensing information as well. Licensing information changes as packages are re-revved. The license associated to each package might change. Then the licensing information contained in the SPDX file that Phosology gives you as a hint will change. So the moment that, you know, consider all that, so when somebody comes to you and asks you for your bomb, right, this is how you feel. Like, okay, well, now I need to produce this bomb. Who knows about this bomb? What's the software bomb? And where do I find all licensing information for all of this Frankenstein of software that I've built and put together without, you know, considering, uh, you know, my backpack? Right, thankfully, after all this, if you haven't quit yet, and none of us has, otherwise the auto project and Zephyr wouldn't be here today, right? There's this stability phase. And I think the stability phase comes from the struggles and the disillusionment. Like during the struggle and the disillusionment, we realize that there's a mismatch between open source and production grade. Open source is not built for production grade. And it's a trade-off and it's our responsibility, right? Initially it was saying that Linaro has two souls that of building open source ecosystem and the other, the proliferation of open sourcing products, that's what I do every day and it's a compromise. So open source is about speed, right? It is tuned for speed. Products are tuned for stability. They are tuned for the least amount of changes possible that I need to do to have the greatest ROI possible. So the issue, and it's true, for open source as well as any relationship in life is that the fast progress that we make during the initial uh, stages of infatuations and dating uh, provides a false sense of readiness. We feel like it's ready, but it's not ready. The only objective of a Yalta project and in Zephyr is that to build reference images that gets you through system on chip selection as soon as possible. I'm going to use this SOC or that SOC, and it works out of the box. It's a reference. It is ages from the final product. But yet, you go fast, and that gives you a false sense of readiness and stability, which is not there because your product is not going to be a reference platform. Reference platforms are not product. Nobody ships 
a Qualcomm RB5 reference platform. And also products would be similar, right? So I think stability phase is where these two worlds are identified as different and a compromise is identified and then the commitment to invest in bridging these two worlds is there, right? So it's a commitment about finding the perfect balance, right? And that's why I picked the seesaw, right? Clearly, uh, when we started this journey, everything was toward readiness, but now we're in the production world, so commitment. Right? And these are just some of the recommendations. There's many more things that can be done. Right? Again, this is based on my experience. So number one, uh, I think it's important to know your ingredients and supply chain. And back in the days, uh, when we kicked off the auto project, uh, but also in general, every day when we build products, uh, we use the analogy that each open source component that you decide to bring into the mix is like an M&A, a merchant acquisition. There's nothing different. It's not your technology, it's not your company, it's somebody, something that somebody else has built. So you don't acquire a company, but you source technology that you haven't designed. Right? So for, all, for each critical component that you're going to be acquiring, identify alternatives, if alternatives exist. Assess and rate. I know this might be boring, but what if all of a sudden you haven't looked at the options and that specific critical component ceases to exist or ceases to be maintained? Now you're going to be the only one maintaining that. The entire cost of ownership is going to be on you. So assess and rate technical viability of options community and industry support, broader community and broader community uh, industry support is clearly, you know, gives you clearly higher rates. And then assess the maturity, past and future based on participations as investments. And there's websites that can help you with that, like uh, OpenHub, formerly known as Olo.net. I've used that a lot. Right? You can just assess based on the code base contributions, activity, and I think there's Project Chaos that does the same. I think there's a session about that at this conference too. But there's tools available today that inspect Git and Git history and Git logs that tells you how a project is active, how many maintainers you have. The more maintainers, the better, right? And then how frequent the updates are provided, right? And that kind of gives you an, an idea of the viability from a technical standpoint and industry backing of the project. Prefer open source project that have an open governance uh, associated to that. It's great to have software and put it out there on the internet with an open source uh, license. But if there's no open governance and industry backing soon enough, you know, it's just a web page and a bit of code. And if something is critical for your product, best if there's other industry players to support that. You're not the only one who had that idea. And if you guys have read the Cathedral in the Bazaar, if you're the only one who had an idea, probably that idea is either stupid or you become billionaire. But chances are none of us is billionaire, so we tend to uh, follow uh, the solutions that somebody else has found for us, even if that means adapting right, the problem definition. Uh, track and know how to pivot. When do I switch from a project, uh, component that was critical but is not, not mature any enough, doesn't have industry backing to another one, or maybe. There is a licensing indication that a component has to be flagged because it's risky. Where do I pivot? Where's my alternative? It goes back to the identifying the alternatives. And then have a roadmap. Right? Your product roadmap, product software roadmap, has to incorporate the release cadence of all the open source projects and components that you have included and sourced into your final image. Because if you don't have an idea of when does project, the other project release? When does component A release, component B releases? Then you're not going to be able to match their release cadence with your product release cadence. You're always going to be fighting time as opposed to planning. Okay? It's my first recommendation. Second recommendation, invest in infrastructure. As you power through the dating phase, you haven't built in, in, in this illustration any infrastructure. Everything was pretty much relying on you. But the moment that you start tracking open source projects, it is very important to have an infrastructure that track repositories that you're pulling and, and, and management of those repositories, an infrastructure that allows you to uh, have different branching strategies, 
uh, allows us to review contributions as they come in and manage those contributions. GitLab, GitHub are perfect, right? They do this uh, and, 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 and spend time. Uh, spend time to make sure that you build auto builders and sanity checks. And sanity checks is against the definition of quality and sanity that you and only you can define. So define a policy. Whether is that an IP policy, whether is that a quality policy, whatever policy you have, you had to build auto builders and sanity checks before you merge a PR that enforce that policy. Otherwise, it's going to be chaos. And then you had to make sure that people know that policy within your group and they're trained because if they don't know, not aware, and they're not trained, what you're doing here is gating development. You're gating innovation by enforcing the policy. So agree on that policy, but then enforce it. That's the definition of quality and auditing. Uh, invest in an infrastructure that allows you uh, to have remote devices and sharing and testing. Hardware is always, always lacking. So as opposed to hope, uh, or demand the hardware group to have a gazillion targets, which they will not give you. Just invest in an infrastructure that allows you to have a, hard, a harder target hooked up and available for everybody in the world to just borrow when they had to do testing and have automated testing, just booting up, powering up, testing hardware, and then booting them down, right? It's a worth investment. And that infrastructure should be generating artifacts for you, whether those are CVEs report, quality reports, a benchmark performance test, compliance reports, whatever is your standard, and then staff it, right? So you can't do this unless you staff an infrastructure. And remember at Huawei, uh, we wanted to build the infrastructure, but we did struggle because we, we not, not I, but there was this false idea that a developer can also be somebody who writes documentation. It can also be somebody who just Right? No, you build an infrastructure, just get a DevOps engineer, maybe two. You don't need much, but you need somebody who's dedicated, undivided attention is toward the infrastructure if it's a critical component. Same for documentation. There's no things as fractional engineering. If I'm a kernel developer, I am a kernel developer. I can't do doc and test cases and infrastructure at the same time. Right? It's just nonsense. It never works. You end up having great kernel drivers and no documentation, no infrastructure because then people tend to choose what they like better, right? And don't put a kernel engineer to become a documentation guy. They don't like it, right? Okay, third, design for compliance. Design for usability, uh, test-driven development, usability-driven development. I think we're in the world of compliance-driven development. And when I say com compliance, I mean really vulnerability, licensing, or standards, right? Have those in mind as you design your infrastructure, your roadmap, the uh, components you're going to be tracking from open source, and so forth. Uh, identify the industry standards that uh, belong to your definition of compliance. Build software bill of material incrementally. Don't wait to the end of the project to build the first software bill of material and then pass it on to an IP auditor, or even worse, hope that what Fosology gives you is correct and complete and 100% uh, accurate because they're not, right? But just if you have an early cadence uh, for a release, do quarterly checkpoints, and at every quarter, just establish different uh, um, coverage and, and, um, and completion uh, of the software bomb. For instance, by first quarter, I want to have 25% of the bomb done. By second quarter, 50%. By third quarter, 75%. And then establish quality criteria as well. By the third quarter, I only had to have five defects, 10 defects, meaning you know IP flagged issues from compliance. Same is true for CVEs and such. Establish incremental coverage right, and qualitative goals. Um, make compliance gating contributions. If you're serious about that, it's about policy. right? Make an IP compliance or a CVE compliance policy gating a PR. Right? So if I check some code in and then the policy uh, which is implemented by the automatic tool chain that triggers Fosology, gives me an incompatible license, that contribution is gated. Again, developers don't like that, but that's the only way that you're going to be enforcing a policy and, and make sure that they're serious about that, right? Train them and make an IP auditor available to the entire development team. Because without an IP auditor, a group of lawyers to ask questions such as, hey, how about that license? How about that license? Are they compatible? Everything is going to happen at the end. 
right? And lawyers cost by the hour a lot of money, right? And inefficiencies are something that you can't afford. Hire, just like the infrastructure, an IP auditor at least, and maybe somebody, a lawyer who's uh, IP and open source friendly as well. You don't have to use those uh, all the time. The IP auditor does, does most of the work. But having a lawyer which is available to the development team not only increases their visibility of the whole picture as opposed to just their kernel driver, uh, but it's also very useful because it addresses problems as soon as possible. And maintain a healthy level of technical debt. Uh, that's my fourth recommendation. So upstream, upstream, upstream. Neil was here before talking about upstreaming, a strategy for upstreaming uh, at Linaro. Upstream is part of the value, but it can't suck 100% of the time. Otherwise, you don't do roadmap development. Best is figure out what is a good amount of time that each developer can dedicate to upstream. 20%, 25%, that's the worst case scenario. Allow for that when you do sprint planning. All right, Neil, 25% this sprint, 20%, 15%, what do you think it's gonna happen? Oh no, I think 10% is enough this sprint, great. But bake upstreaming into the capacity available because otherwise it's gonna be an afterthought. And what you're gonna you know, find that happens is that at the end of the sprint, one developer only closed 10% of their points because they spent all the time upstreaming and that was not foreseen. And it's absolutely something that one can plan. So make it a high priority task uh, during spring planning and make it a release criteria. If you need to manage technical debt, you can decide that before you release your product and software for your product, 80% of the changes that you've made, that made into that layer, they have to be contributed upstream. It can be 70, it can be 60, it can be 1%, so long as it is a release criteria item. Uh, the gates that release, right? Because only if you make it a release gating criteria, you're serious about managing your technical debt. Otherwise, it's gonna be wishy-washy. Yeah, I know that I need to manage my technical debt, but I never have time to do so, right? And then participate and influence, right? Remember that? Who's that handsome guy to the right side of the picture? <laughs> this is Barcelona, 1925. Yes, see me? So drive and predict it's better than follow and adjust. If you're using critical components in your production software, don't just let others drive their technical roadmap. Participate, be one of those industry big, big backer that, baker, backer that belong and participate to the project, right? It's just like being electing a representative to the government without checking and monitoring what they do, right? And then you can complain that the country goes in the direction where you don't want it to go, right? So the same is here. So if you use something which is critical to you, make sure that you can influence the direction. Contribute my time and money uh, to open governance. It's not just about contributing and working with the technical community, but it's also about advisory boards and uh, different committees. Again, you can complain if all of a sudden the author project decides to abandon GCC for LLVM, right? And you just didn't know about that. And then you had to change your release plan if you don't participate and influence that choice. And keep yourself informed, like being at this conference, and seek advice. And from now on, you can call me, right? I can help you with your relationship. Uh, open source law relationship if you want, but there's plenty of companies and individuals that can help you. So hopefully if you follow this advice, and there's just many more, this is just like the top ones. Uh, Phil, can you think of, anybody can think of any other advice? Or did I touch the most important ones? Yeah? And hopefully we get to the bliss phase. Remember we had the seesaw completely unbalanced before, right? It's always a balancing act. Remember, remember tune for speed, tune for stability. Right, it's a balancing act. And you go right and you go left, and, but so long as you just, you don't fall, I think you're good and predict the trajectory. With that said, I wanna leave some time for questions, uh, five minutes to the end. Um, I will invite you to Linaro Connect. That's gonna happen May 14, 17th in Madrid. If you're interested, registration is still open. You can just point your camera to the QR code, 
I'm going to leave this up there for 30 seconds. And then you can come and meet us at fifth floor, me and the Linaro crew at the Linaro booth. If you have any questions uh, from this talk or any of the other talks that my Linaro uh, friends uh, have given uh, during this conference. And with that, questions. It's, so Open Hub is not mend. <clears throat> it is just the analysis of Git repos. And so I don't know if you ever added a project, and I think I've done a couple of times once you add a project there. Uh, and what I'm trying to say is just don't take everything that you see for granted. What was the other one? Uh, chaos, C-H-A-O-S-S, -S, I think. It doesn't have a repository like Open Hub built on Git repository that you submit and project that you claim. But it's got a set of tools in the dashboard for you to be able to at least measure your own uh, software stack. Right? And there's plenty of tools out there, uh, contributions and such. It's all about productivity. We're talking about production grade software. So what we measure, we can fix. What we can't measure, we can do anything about that. Did you guys get the question, right? OK. Other questions? No more questions? Yeah, so it's always, it's always a compromise and a trade-off. And I did use the uh, analogy with an M&A emergent acquisition, right? And it's something that um, management usually understand. If you are merging two companies or two technologies and you're just bringing on board technology that you don't know, you haven't built, you haven't designed, right? you're not gonna get rid of all the people <laughs> who have built it, because otherwise you're gonna be in trouble. So if you, wanna, if you wanna go with that analogy, if you're insourcing technologies that you haven't built from open source community, right, you're not gonna be onboarding those people. Those people are out there. And the only way to communicate with them, right, and to reduce the technical debt is that to make sure that what you change is accepted by that and then maintained by them so that you can always transfer the cost of ownership and cost of maintenance to uh, the mainstream of a project. Right, so that's the analogy that you can go with. And then, but the best thing is just math, right? Just go linear, right? So the amount of line of codes that stays with me and the company, if I don't upstream, which is branched off, is gonna grow over time and increase over time. And then there's just software engineering metrics out there that tells you how many bugs and what is the cost of maintenance per lines of code or 10 line of code or 1,000 lines of code. So that analogy of just keeping that layer, that technical, that, that backpack as thin, as light as possible plays into that. It's a compromise, right? Okay, well, you can keep it growing forever, and then in five years, the cost may be unbearable, or you can just keep it going for one year or two years. It doesn't get in the way of just product launch, but then you might just decide that it's the time to reset, flush it out, and then restart, right? And, and then the cost of, and then if you go with that analogy, you could say, well, then but why do I have to wait two years when I could just invest 15% of the bandwidth or 10% of the bandwidth of somebody to just work on infrastructure and constant tracking. I don't have to wait those two years and stop production because all I have to do for two months is upstream, which is something which is out of your control because you know, upstreaming requires somebody else to accept in your changes. So you know, usually math helps. Just my advice is don't keep it like, oh, it's common sense, duh. Because it just doesn't work well. It's just like, hey, have you thought about this? And how about I build a simulator that tells you what is the cost if we do this versus this versus that? Sounds good.
process for uh, more in, in uh, commercial projects over time, what might not be a technical depth at, at the decision time, when it becomes depth, if you put an example, what if these ski stops being maintained tomorrow, you didn't really take a decision that was bad and had any technical depth when you made it, but it might become. And I see the threat is that people have a hard time accepting that a good decision is later on a bad decision. Yes, this is the part where, and this is not science, like there's a bit of gut as well. It's just like, do I invest in this company or other company? How's that project going? And that's where keep yourself informed come into play. But, and it's harder for a tool chain, like what alternative is there, you know, to GCC, right? Well, there's alternatives, but 10 years ago, what alternative is there? So sometimes you have your back against the wall, against the wall. Some other times, whenever you can, just find alternatives. Exactly. You're, you're not responsible for those. They just happen to. Yes. Yeah, but people have a hard time accepting that what they made was a good decision, but now they have to redo it. Yeah. So that kind of technical debt grows over time, but people are not very good at reducing it. Yeah. So it just it happens, right? It's, it's, I would say that it's the technical debt that doesn't depend from what you do right it's probably more rare than the technical debt that you create yourself so i think probably the best approach would be try to minimize your technical debt and be aware that at some point something might happen that wasn't due to your decisions that might lead to a, a technical debt uh, reduction scramble it requires a lot of education in, in especially with upper management all right i think time's up thank you for attending guys and again uh, register to Linaro uh, Connect and come visit us at the booth and enjoy the rest of the conference.
slide screen. Yeah, this works. I hear myself. There's an on off button right at the bottom. Just repeat the question because your recording stream. Okay.
Yeah. So I guess we have it 2.15. Time to kick off. Thanks to all of you who come just after lunch and uh, use the chance to fall asleep in the next 45 minutes. Before the meeting, I already said it happened to a few people in the past, so enjoy relaxing 30, 35 minutes. And when the people start, other people start talking again, then it's Q&A and it's time to leave or stay for the next talk. Uh, let me give you a short intro about who am I. I'm a Bosch product manager for Linux and embedded open source. And if you see product management, it doesn't mean I'm no longer a deeply embedded engineer. I mean, deeply embedded is more also anyway the RTOS, not the embedded Linux, but let's discuss about it later. I'm also uh, the chair of the technical steering committee within the ELISA project from Linux Foundation. And I'm also a member of the inaugural advisory board of the Linux Foundation Europe. And in my private time, I'm an open source enthusiast, which also brought me basically to the three positions which I currently have. And uh, there I have a long time with different kind of Linux systems and so on, uh, open source messaging things. And one thing which came across my time, and it's actually not the longest time, it exists very long. So we talk about Apertus, and Apertus exists since 13 years, roughly, with different names. Uh, it reinvented itself several times, and most of these 13 years I sp didn't spend in a Debian environment. I still spent with, in the Yocto world. But, um, well, there was this coexistence within my business unit and my business area of Bosch with Apertus, and we had to always a great support by the Collabra people, which were supporting us in going this Debian way. And yeah, I give you several elements of this talk, so I would like to set the scene, say why was this actually started, what was the pain, or what was the things why people considered uh, from the architectural software architectural team to go with the Debian-based distro or product, what makes a part a part what's inside, so how does the infrastructure look like, and I keep it on a quite high level because there's the Apertus org, which is a good starting point to uh, basically read a lot of things, have a lot of guidelines in their descriptions, how decisions were made, what was done. And I also show you some production examples because otherwise you could believe that I just faked everything and there's nothing really in use later on. How you can try it out and yeah, I had no name for the, after the experience for the what else comes in there. So there's a what else to say session part. Uh, I will give some information about the CIP project. So I like that there are even some CIP people here. And uh, I would like to also give some time for discussions. Right. Uh, I also have a Pertus and CIP stickers later on if you're getting so convinced and are still able to come to the stage that uh, I could just pick them up. Shortly setting the scene with the highest level slide. This is from a former colleague of mine. He presented it so often that I just thought it's nice to get it in again. Um, he said, from the automotive environment where we came from, our products were in the past typically done with the SOP. So you have a fire and forget policy. You know they are getting into the market. They are not updated anymore. And we were so much concentrating on things like hardware cost. You focus on your SOP deadline. You look what are differentiating factors. How can I just get something in there? And um, flexibility was a kind of thing like just to think, what is the next generation? But not that more on there, and you were considering what is the lowest risk. So what you didn't have in mind were things like reuse across different platforms, or also the maintenance costs which you have to keep it up and running to do updates. Uh, upstream was always somehow on the agenda, and some people here are actually from companies which did some of the upstreaming work also with Bosch Together, also more also in the based project. And, um, but this was also something to say, what do we do about this? So this is basically where we came from. We saw a changing trend of connected devices. We saw that a lot of different projects started. And then there was Apertus or the product which came before. So what is Apertus? I don't know where the statement is, if it's on the website or not. I just found it in an old set of slides as well. Um, basically, it's here, a Linux-based distribution. Now we say more construction kit which should say that it's giving you also the ecosystem around this, what, is the what a distribution makes. And it was built for infotainment. For those which are not aware of the word infotainment, it's basically your navigation device in the center 
of your car in the front dashboard, so where you listen to music and radio and plug in your USB stick and so on. And Bosch did this for many, many different products, and not everything was aligned. So sometimes the people just started a new project with a new SOC and so on, and was the willingness to more commonalize it, find a reuse, find a place, how to have common elements, standard packages involved. And here, yeah, this is basically where it gets tailored for industrial needs. And here it says it's based on Debian. Uh, we were partially also on the path of Ubuntu originally in there. Uh, because they had more update cycles. We found Debian a little bit slow at this time, how they do the uh, major updates, but this changed uh, because we figured also customers were also not respect expecting more updates. So that's why we are now with fully with Debian. Uh, and we also saw that other parties make use of it, so we'll see something about this also later on. We have ARM support for ARM32 and ARM and x86, and ARM64 both are in. Uh, and we also have some kind of SDK, cloud service environment, so basically to ease your production. Where does this fit into? Um, the first, of course, is the automotive, but we also checked for other devices. We did some prototyping on a uh, lawnmower, so we may created an IoT smart lawnmower out of it because Bosch also had these kind of products. Actually, not in production, it was more prototyping. Uh, Linux, you can find also in bicycle, for example, but uh, for this strip down, I guess we used another one. And then also in the bottom, you can see some measurement equipment. So this is something where you will later have also an example. So what does it mean from an ecosystem perspective? Everything you need to know, you can find on apertis.org. And a lot of my material is also there. What I like, I said it earlier, is that a lot of decisions are also reported there. So you can also see like how are things happening. The good thing is that there were work products in there where, for example, Bosch did a request also to a Pertis team within Colabra and asked them, can you enable this or that functionality? We have this or that requirement. And what they typically did is they went to a Pertis org and also documenting certain reasons for their decisions, like uh, when we migrated to GitLab, when we run away from Fabricator, uh, where, which certain packages were selected, the decision why we went from Ubuntu uh, yeah, from Ubuntu to Debian directly. So these are all things which you find on the web page. And this would be the best time to fall asleep because the rest uh, you can still also read on the web page. <laughs> a central part of Apertis, which is a little bit different to maybe standard things, is a uh, package-centric approach. What does it mean? Um, yeah, usually if you're a developer, you want to concentrate on developing your application. And you maybe don't want to do that much with your sources, with building, spend a lot of disk space, hours of building a product. Uh, and this is when 10 years back where there were nothing like an S state in Yocto or so, right? It was basically something where we had said, you should have something in. And what you may know from your typical environment is that you come, and this is not really Yocto or Debian thing or so, if you have a set of packages, maybe you figure out, oh, I install another package. I add something. And what could also happen is, even if it's in your, just in your development and you start developing, you're looking, at, oh, right, there's this component. I make use of this component. And there's something which is not 100% behaving. And then I start changing something in there, which is actually not my component. And then I bring my component. I integrate it. I bring it into the product. And I missed to inform that I have certain local modifications and some other things, maybe just for some debugging purpose or so on. But at some point of time, you will get a failure by this because you have local modifications. We also saw this when you go with a build. We had a fixed build set done. You go from one developer desk to another developer desk, and things start to behave differently. Right? And then you ask, what have you changed? I changed nothing. And then there's a question, why? when you have changed nothing, why have you compiled it? Uh, yeah, these were the kinds, and this is where we said, oh, we want to have something, and we want to steal the power from development by uh, giving them just binaries. This was something which I heard several times, but I mean, it's, you can do other tricks around it, so this is just that. But this is about the packages. And also one concern which came up was like, there are packages which are doing the job, but you may favor maybe another packages which you know from the past, or which does the same thing. So you may end up with multiple packages doing the same thing or a similar thing. So this is something where the apertus said we have a set of packages and whenever you want to have something new, 
you need to make a package request rather than just adding things. And uh, this increases also that we have a better reproducibility of the results because of there's all the binaries elements in there. And what we also had was we were working a lot with uh, air copyright protected intellectual property things. We have come from the infotainment world. We talk with, uh, for example, with Apple because you need to attach your iPhone. You have Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, their proprietary element in there. And by this, we need to see how do we get through the stack? Where do we replace certain libraries which are changing over time to GPL3, for example? Uh, there was a bash time, and I guess many still use bash and may use a bash in the version which is GPLv3, but we replace it with dash, check with scripts, maybe may behave differently or so. So this was done as in work, and the documentation around this is also on the apparatus org. That's why I put the link in there. Uh, yeah, we had the core utils. We replaced it by Rust core utils where fun missing functionalities were in there. We added this. And when I say we, it's basically the people around the apparatus community. So it's not always Bosch, but also with Collabra and others working in there. Um, yeah, GNU GPL was, or GNU PG was one example. And interesting was also when we placed from, uh, from the tar and we went to BSD tar and we later on just figured out that we have some if issues if we use containers because there were some functionality actually not in there. So we had to implement this also for BSD tar. So the evaluation was not perfect. And uh, yeah, all these kind of packages, they end up in a package repository. So we keep this under apparatus org and the GitLab instance of it. And we have roughly 70, uh, 7,000 packages in there. And if you uh, yeah, look into the environment um, of 7,000 packages, I guess the Red Hat Enterprise Linux size is roughly 5,000 packages. Uh, for other systems, this is maybe 15,000, 20,000 packages, but this is basically the core where we say this is elements which are used somewhere for some functionality, some maybe also not used, and the later product will be just a smaller subset of it. The things the packages get collected into images and into releases. So uh, you find typically three releases. There's one release under development and two which are running in a regular quarterly base. So currently, uh, I took this from April now. You can see that we have still the maintenance of 23. So the 23 version of it gets a quarterly update. So at the beginning of 23, you will have 23.0, and then it gets .1, .2, .3. 3.4 or 5 until 7, and after 7, you're at the end of two years. And similar is for 2024, and now we are in the development for 2025, which means uh, it's DAV2, it's a second quarter development. This is currently on the 6.6 .6 kernel, and later during the year when the next LTS version of the kernel will come toward the end, the real version of the 2025 will be the next LTS kernel version. For packages, we are aligned to the Debian releases, so we jumped there basically, we took look what is the released version, and then we migrate this new release version into the development version and bring this forward. So currently most of the things are on Bookworm, and I guess maybe, I'm not sure if the 23 is still on Bullseye, but there is a release package list so that you can just see which version of which package are include. Right. Uh, yeah, for kernel, uh, we follow the LTS kernel. So we were also doing more frequent updates of the kernel, but there were customers also saying we don't need more updates than just the releases on the LTS version. And we say that it's yeah, every year we come with a new LTS and we really recommend also all to just migrate every year to a new version of the Linux so that you always stay quite close and don't end up into many, many years of long-term support on a simul kernel version. So with now the CRA changes and the LTS announcement also by Greg Hartman, this was something where we thought, okay, it falls into the pattern which we anyway were doing. So we're not supporting any kernel longer than two years currently. All right, that's on this. Uh, I put this table in here. So this is basically showing how these things are, what I just mentioned. So if there is a certain quarter, can we see, let me see if I get my mouse somewhere. You can see here are the development steps, and then there is a pre-release after Dev3, and it goes on then with a .0, .1, and so on. So we have a total three years for one version of Apertus, 
and then uh, it ends. And this gives you also on the right, you can see here you have two years of overlap. So you have really time while you are on this one. Maybe for production, you can change over for your next update on the development and then move on so that you have continuously updates on the different version. You may have different ideas on how you want to update based on if you are in a pre-production phase, then you may be more aggressive changing just the version from one to the other so you can live a little bit faster. But with the production phase, you always have a year for preparation to change to a new kernel version and then another year. And the nice thing is that you typically either change the kernel version first or you change a Debian version. So the most issues come with kernel version updates typically, even if there is not too much dependent these, these days, but uh, so you have issues with the kernel version update, less issues with the security path in there, but um, it basically gives you the time and gives an argumentation how to go forward. And all these releases get tested. So there you can find test results on QA or uh, There are A for automatic tests, there are manual test suites also executed. Uh, I hate this QA app tool thing which is in there, so I never find myself really comfortable in finding locks and so on, but basically you get an impression. It's also not including all test cases because there are a bunch of test cases in there um, which are just coming from packages. They are also in included during the CI phase, but they are not reported. So we do some pre-integration testing, which would mean uh, you have a package, there's a change in the package. The package itself comes from upstream and brings upstream testers. If the test fails, it will never make it into the release. So this is something uh, where I say, if soon as a package unit test level fails, you don't get it mainline or with just significant exceptions, but uh, normally this doesn't work. So you see basically extended testing in the QA, rep QA report. And uh, yeah, we have different variants with apt and OS tree. With apt mean you can have the apt package manager on your target and then just install new packages. It could be in your virtual box image or also while you're developing. Later on, if you move on in production, we typically remove the package manager because you should have a stable package version and just provide OS tree updates. Right, uh, reference parts I already mentioned. What's nice is that we just recently had the uh, new TI chipset available, so it's with version 2025. It's just coming, the first releases are in. And this is the Tara platform because there are new products really asking for it. And what I also like a lot is that we have the STAK tasks on the QEMO, so it gets some additional testing when you done it is for the development phase, not for the production. The test lab looks a little bit like this. So this is the Colabra Lava test farm. Uh, I figured out that also some CIP testing results were also executed there and also that the CIP test, lava test also uh, did kernel CI testing on apparatus and so on. So it's very nice about this. So it's connected to kernel CI. And over this, yeah, the whole apparatus infrastructure is very few things which are really more or less tailored, glued. It's a lot of really looking into open source environment tools. We were using Fabricator. It's in the top right corner for project management things, issue trapping, and so on. But uh, this was deprecated, so we moved on. You find the details also described why we moved away from it on the Apertus org side, how we came to the new, what was main drivers for it. So also these kind of managerial decisions are put in. Uh, we have robot framework support, but I don't know too many robot framework test cases in there. Uh, yeah. We had update on Potman. Potman was an interesting story because Potman is in this very fast development pace still. So uh, if you look in there, we are on an older version of Potman currently because with the latest version of Potman, we had so many package dependencies that we really got conflicts with the uh, Debian bookworm release. So it was so much behind that we need to make a trade-off in the version. I guess we're now in version three or something like this for Potman. And with Potman, we also figured out that there were some uh, BSD tar issues which we had to solve, right? The whole infrastructure, um, here, basically, we start from sources, and what's interesting here is we take the Debian sources and we create Debian package out of it again. So we're not directly taking Debian binaries. Uh, we also add BSP parts from vendors in there and proprietary sources because not everything may be open source, which ends up in your product. So it gets into the uh, GitLab instance. We have also 
private product instances where you don't see this. So if you build a product on it, you may not want to unveil your Google or Apple source codes or whatever comes in or your something where what you claim as differentiating IP. So we have this as an environment, but you can also just have the open view on this. Then it gets things built. Some part may be binary, which you don't need to pour, put in a repository like GPU drivers and so on. The binaries get patched and then you have the targets afterwards. Yeah, it's of course cross compiled. I just mentioned it because recently some of my colleagues started just do native compiling on PCs and say this is much cooler than the rest. Yeah, updates and so on. Uh, the Apertus folks also told me that this is the better representation of it. It's basically the same part as here, but I found there were too many connections, so I just put it in the slide set. So if you later on look into it, you can see what follows from where to where, how the flows are. And then we would go for the experience section. Uh, my favorite product is the Bosch Power Tools. It's uh, DTAC 200. 200 means this is a wall scanner which can go 200 millimeters inside a wall with radar technologies or whatever it is. And they can just scan and see, is there some electric, is there some wires, some pipes, whatever could go in there. And it also tells you in which distance they are. Um, for our markets in US, Europe, and most part, they are on a, I think on a five centimeter accuracy or something like this. And in Japan, there, is, there are regulations which need to guarantee how thick the wall need to be in millimeters before the uh, iron grid comes, which you typically put into the side. And in Japan, this is an actual measurement equipment where it's going on the millimeter level accuracy with it. So there's much more, but for the normal grade, this is not needed. Um, yeah, and the Bosch Power Tools are a subsidiary of Bosch, and they were new because before they were doing microcontroller environment, and they suddenly need to have something more powerful with an HMI and so on, and they figured out, okay, let's look for some low-level hardware, so it's uh, really more an entry device level, and they saw that they get good support also on, uh, from the apparatus team from the infotainment side, so they are there, and why did they do so? They are a team of 10 to 20 people, and they didn't want to bother a lot with selecting the right packages. They said, we don't want to set up our own CI. We better rely on something where we have, and we want to have a focus on our application development. And uh, these are the great promoters of it. And they also make heavy use of uh, virtual box images for it. So that's basically for their pre-development activities and help them also a lot of times. So this is how the virtual box image looks like. They have a cute based are here, this, and for how is, should I say, the simulation. Basically, if you look at it, it looks very similar, so all the elements are in there. This is the environment where you can just click on it and it behaves like the actual device. And what I found really cool was that they also have the measurement data in there. So when we had the COVID-19 starting, they all went into home office, and what they did was there's from time to time, there was a person going into the office and recording new walls with raw data from the sensor. And then they just had the raw data recording, put it into the virtual box image, and they could just continue developing. And the nice thing was the packages which you have in, they are exactly the one which you see on the target. The behaviors, very similar. I, I don't say identical. It's nearly identical, but still there's one is an ARM environment, one is an x86 environment, right? So it's not 100% accurate, but like this. And this is what is one benefit, so they are much faster in their developing when they have, they do, and the hardware, they have very small numbers and not so they cannot afford to create too much sample hardware. So this helps. And, uh, here, I mean, this is was what I always heard from simulation environments where it's beneficial. I was still asking for what, where is another selling point on this, and they told me that they have deeply embedded developers, which really work typically on microcontroller level. They really just check directly on algorithms. But these algorithms, which are on the other device categories where they are developed on the mass production part also, they bring these into the apertus environment for the higher level premium devices. And for this, maybe it's twice to four times a year where they need to change something in the algorithm, doing updates, doing better performance or so. 
at this time, they download the VirtualBox image, they start a Linux environment, they make sure that the things compile there, they simulate what they have tested in there, and then they give it to someone else who just put in a package. And this lowers the barrier for a lot of them who come from the deeply embedded space say, I don't want to get around all these. I want to do my make things and I want to try things out. And that's what they directly can do in there. And this helped them a lot to just get away from these confusing parts. So that was the reason for it. And yeah, another device, this is not from Bosch. There was just recently also a news on this and it was showcased during the Embedded World last week was from the Atari VCS. This was also a product which uses our apparatus, infrastructure, elements, tools. They don't give full insights what's all in there. It basically just says it uses the apparatus parts in there. Uh, it's doing it since some time. So, and maybe you consider to buy one apparatus v uh, Atari VCS system. It has a lot of other features, of course, in there as well. So you can find Western Wayland, uh, Chrome Browser, Rust. I also just named it to see what kind of features are also in there, what libraries you can find within the purchase. So basically what you normally need for your development. And what I also really like, uh, this is since 2021, you can actually use the Raspberry Pi imager and find a purchase there since 2021. So there's even a low entry uh, way into it, so if you're new, if you are forced maybe to use a Windows environment, or if you are uh, not directly want to download and you're used to DDing your image on the SD card or whatever, you can just go with the standard Raspberry Pi imager and gets in there. And th I think it's support for Raspberry Pi 4. I don't know if it's also for the older version, but also Colabra confirmed that they continue their support on this for the next year so that they also make sure that things get tested and properly working and in case there are issues that they respond to it. Yeah, this is on the apertus part in the Raspberry Pi where you can try out. And we come to the last part of it. What else to say? Uh, I would like to put a spotlight on the CIP project because while apertus is there, it's under no foundation. It's not, it's basically and mainly driven by Colabra and Bosch, and it's all open source, but it's no governance around it, and so you could say what happens if people go out. Uh, with the CIP project, we also find something on an industrial grade level in the Debian space, Debian world. From Bosch, we also became a member of the CIP project. Uh, one major difference with the CIP platform compared to what we have with Apertus is, I guess, the lifetime of the kernel. While we also work on products which work for 10 to 20 years or so, the CIP project also has longer expectations on keeping the products running. And they also have certain, certain certification which may require to be on a version where updates getting harder. So this is something where we have a slightly different approach, but as CIP also goes for mainline first part and then just backport the things on the LTS and super long-term supports parts. This is something uh, where we see a strong correlation. The activities, um, the CIP has a very set of core packages and a little bit of extended packages, and then the rest need to come from use. It's also very similar to what we have from the ideas. And I guess it's, it's always important to see where do the ideas are comparable. You do not find your 100% solution, but you find a lot of space where you can collaborate in. And um, that's what we have. The lava testing was really great, and we figured out that uh, I think one, one effect was that we are now porting the squad from, uh, from the Linaro team also as a reporting tool while we still stick with Apertus on the QA app because it's settled and bound to the infrastructure. That's something that we have still in parallel lava testing, package hardening and so on. And yeah, also what's in there if you're not convinced about a pure Debian environment and you still would like to play around and take some Yocto elements, or you feel better comfortable with it. Uh, the build tooling, in the CIP project, it's called ESAR for Integration System for Automated Root File System Generation. Uh, it's basically driven by uh, IBIS, a German company, and Siemens. Siemens also sponsoring it. And yeah, it's there to bootstrap the Demium based system. You can customize things, create firmware images, basically all the things which you can also do with an apertus, but more related. And the ESAR uses CAS, which is then the meter tooling underneath, and this is running then on bitbake layers and bringing the whole thing into the environment 
I don't do a too long explanation on this because uh, you can hear a lot of things from the depth conf. <laughs> so, and basically I took some of the information from the presentation there and also from what's in the docs of GitHub, so therefore you find your input part here. One thing which I also want to mention, uh, I showed a lot of things on this little changes, mixing of systems and so on, and this is basically there to say, if you see some rooms for improvement, there's also always a challenging part and find your way and what makes your things best. And you all see it when you look into your, down to your keyboard, when you start programming, maybe some of you have already changed something. I still do hard and changing to new. I always want to do it since a long time, but I stick with my used layout, keyboard layout, even showing the benefits. And what I want to mention is the old typewriter patent from 1868 was created to have these mechanical shifts while typing that these different levers do not block while typing. So they were optimized for a mechanical typewriting, not blocking thing. They were not optimized for language. And if you would optimize something for the language you write in, you can see this color coding, and this is the color coding from the Neo. And there is also uh, the Dvorak part. There is alternatives in there, so a lot of layouts with multi-layers, also better for programming. Uh, yeah, and the, the smallest part is that you have the, also the art 30 or the quartz with that instead of the Y for the German part, for example, and uh, I find this a very nice thing so that you should always change just because you have a very spread solution or a very mature solution, existing long-term solution, sometimes it's good to challenge just say, is this really the best solution? And what elements are maybe somewhere sorted out elsewhere? What can I improve? Where can I change things? And these can be challenges like say, well, I know that I am taking certain uh, there are products which are running on a long time. What do I do with my packages? Can I really just go with the mainline kernel? What are my requirements? What can I change? What can I not change? Of course, you would, if you're still using a mechanical typewriter, changing the keyboard layout will be a waste of time because you're running in an environment where you need to do it. If you change to something else, it could be something to consider. Uh, other things which we had were the 100 plus SOPs. Uh, a good was a common infrastructure cost project people find themselves welcome or familiar, even if they change a product, a project, or a platform, an SOC type, and so on. And what I also think what's one of the challenges worth I learned once from an integrated or assigned who was always changing the binary part after compilation manually for a certain thing which he figured out. And he went on vacation. And we were wondering why the build didn't work anymore properly. And we said, it, it's, something is strange. What has he done? There's something missing in the documentation. And then we figured out, oh, they said, yeah, of course, whenever I do this, I change this binary directly because there's a flaw in the binary. So it doesn't mean if you go for binary, you're done. Uh, but that's also when you have control about sources, it's even easier to change something and so on. So this was something which we also had a challenge in there to say, how do we avoid this last mile changes? And if we are start and do the CI system and say we only accept the CI, being fully automated, it's much harder to do later on some checks. And if there's a fully automated flow until the testing, which we have, in, this really helps you also to avoid that you have local modification from single persons. And by this, uh, I encourage also to solve challenges together in which products, so ever, if you become a Debian fan over time, if you try things out, reach out. We're still looking also to bring this into an environment like a foundation. Also, so that's something which we would also consider from a purchase side, but it's, I know it's also not easy to get something forward and it's nicer to solve problems together than getting a solution with a solved problem. By this, I would like to include, say thank you. I just see two people over time who almost fall asleep. So that's very good. And uh, yeah, if there are questions, let me know. Lift your arm off the question. I have a mic here. I may also be able to repeat the question. So. Any questions in the last, yes, we have five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe. Here, Drew, you want to use a microphone and hand it over? Sure. 
So I, I saw that uh, you listed OS tree and then uh, package-based stuff for uh, updates during yep. development. Uh, do you have a plan for in, you know production-level uh, over-the-air updates for this setup? Yeah. So there are production-level updates on the OS tree, and we also implemented ROG, but the ROG part is not officially supporting the apparatus yet. I don't know if it will come or not. There we had a long discussion because there is already something and does it serve, what is the better solution and so on. So you never know, there could also be a software update part from the CIP which could be taken over, but we had some customers which wanted to use ROG and then we said, okay, we get a ROG in and they were other said, no, we will not change and say, okay, that's the point where you start with two and where you break with your rule of keeping one, preferably. Yeah. Maybe Drew, you can hand over. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, my question is about the, the licensing aspect that you, you yeah. saw. So there were, you replaced Bash <coughs> with Dash. Uh, can you explain what, what is the motivation behind uh, avoiding particular licenses? Yeah, I mean, if you have a GPL v3 strong copyleft license, you need to change and you need to open source code. You need to uh, give away also tool chain, the reproduction parts of it. And this is sometimes really tricky and hard to really fulfill the demands when you have closed environments where you're actually not allowed at all to share anything. The hardest restriction which we had was on a tool where we are just allowed to provide the results of the tool execution when the other company has exactly the same version license of the tool. This was really strange. There was some, some analysis debugging tool to set and this was a very proprietary one. And it was really said, okay, we wanted to show the debugging results to another party, to the results of the tool. And they said, you are only allowed to share these results when they have a license with the exact same version of the tool. And in this environment with Apple and so on, we said the easiest way is to see where can we get away of certain copyleft activities. Not that we don't like it. What we also do is uh, the same thing is we were commercializing certain things. So if you go, uh, we have not for the apertus part directly, but in the apertus environment, we were also using Wolf SSL and they have a commercial license and a non-commercial license. You saw the cute in there. There's also commercial license. If I'm correct, I, I'm not in the power tools people's side. So there's also then that there's the commercial license used rather than the fully open one. So, so um, this would be a carrot for any commercial product developer to use a purchase because it kind of guarantees that copyleft uh, copy license uh, components are not part yeah, yeah. So, so you said this would be the current. I just repeat before the virtual audience. So you said it would be a current to take this for product developers because they can make sure that nothing on from a strong copy left is in there. Uh, yeah, but of course you also tie in then in an environment, right? It's it's your choice. You get a pre-checked environment. Actually, this was a feedback which I got when I went to Embedded World last year. I was presenting a product there at the Bosch booth. And there were a lot of, lot of small, middle-sized enterprise there which said, that's really great because we know licenses thing is there, you have the CI, we know it's running in product, Bosch has a certain name as a brand, we know that it gets stability and it releases a lot of pains from us. Uh, so we would be ha they were quite happy to hear about a purchase. And the nice thing is, I mean, you can use it as it is and you can also buy a commercial plan and you can buy a commercial plan for your product support either from Colabra or also from Bosch side. Uh, while we, from Bosch, of course, often also look into larger size customers because that depends, but also the power tool guys with 15 people from inside, they also are the customer inside Bosch and not directly with Colabra, yeah. Okay. So I, I work in Yachtra Project a lot, um, but I've also worked in ICER and, and costs yeah. a lot. And so I saw that you put that up there. So I'm, thinking, I'm guessing, if I just simply took ISAR and pointed at the a purchase package feed, I am building a purchase now, or something you close. Ex so yeah, it's... Because um, it's not gonna be the DevOS tool or whatever, however you say the tool. No, that you, you can also you can also go to the sources there and get these sources. Um, it could be like when we create a new product, we do a cross check. We have the 7,000 packages and we looked into some more detail, not, and when we get a product configuration, now there's a product build, we do a cross check that things are really are as they are. Um, if you have an own CI, but exactly this is a use case which we also have inside Bosch where 
there's a lot of other units also which make use of Yocto, of course. And for some, they said, okay, what really brings out the benefit is are the Debian sources. And therefore, they just pull in the Debian sources from a purchase and use the standard Yocto toolchain. Yeah, because for those who don't know, with ICER, you can still write a recipe that's still a bit big recipe. So yeah. now you can build some new yeah. vertical, vertical, um, vertical stack, you know, value add software yeah. with recipes and not have to learn everything about Debian packaging necessarily. Exactly. I mean, it's the thing, if you're completely new to the environment, if you haven't built Linux-based product, then it could be a start, you could have a free choice, but if you're settled in Debian completely and move Debian things to Yocto fully, the path may be a little bit faster because you can just say, okay, I, I take my, my sources, but I think from both directions. If you're used to a certain environment, it's very hard to go to a new environment. Like we saw with the keyboard also, right? If you are typing since a long time and you feel very good with it, to learn the new tool, it will always take, so you cannot simply swap to a new Adorax setup. So this is, even if it's better for you or it solves some of your problems, it doesn't mean that you will really do maybe do another training or just do some addition. So yeah, and that's why, I mean, you, you need to find the solution. So the other thing I was very interested in was the, emulation, the emulated product, because um, I had worked on a team where we had test-driven development yeah. <coughs> using um, MinGW, right? So we, we were actually compiling and running in an emulated environment six months before we had any hardware. PCB layout yeah. wasn't yeah. even done yet, and we had run all of this testing. So I think that was really intriguing. I'm wondering how much of that could, you know, be common tool chains or you know tools to create these virtual environments and so on, so yeah. that we could all benefit from that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That would be something useful. I guess that's also what's coming now more with the software-defined vehicle topics around from the automotive world, which I'm familiar most with, where they also say we can shorten the cycles without not having hardware yet, but getting closer to simulations, getting thing with having ARM servers because a lot of things are ARM-based. Yeah. Right. I guess we need to wrap up. Uh, my official time is over since two or three minutes, and I guess there will be a next speaker. So normally there's someone holding a QA stop, but I guess there is no stop sign today, so I will just stop here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> most likely. All right, then uh, here, I said already thanks. Reach out to me if you want a sticker. Uh, stay here. I guess I will go to the hallway to not bother more people. And thanks a lot for your participation. So we recently connected on LinkedIn. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's kind of cool because I think some people are out there. Everybody always wants to compare, you know, one thing to another, right? And it's like, you know, oh, it's Yonko versus yeah. whatever, right? And I think it's a little disingenuous to have those conversations. And yeah. So, um, I think it's like you said, you know, sometimes a new tool needs to come along, but um, I honestly had not looked yet, and somebody else said, hey, you should go to this talk, right? So I realized <laughs> cool. who you were, yeah. and that you were giving the talk. Good job. So thank you.
mercado. No, 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 Testing, testing, hello, hello. Okay.
Okay, so that, that, as this is recorded. It seems that we need to start again, so <laughs> sorry for that. So, welcome here. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to make a presentation on the Raspberry Pi 5. Uh, the most interesting part of the presentation will be talking about how it was not working, and then it was working because we did a lot of stuff. So, who I am? I'm Alejandro Pino Iglesias. I have been working in Galia for 16 or 17 years now. Uh, on the last four years, I have been working uh, for the drivers of the Raspberry Pi, the OpenGL and the Vulkan drivers, but in the last three years, I have been more focused on the Vulkan drivers. Uh, before that, I also have some experience with the Intel GPUs. So, just in case, I'm, I'm going to start to start with an introduction on, on concept. So, what is MESA? MESA is the most important project and on most free software project related with um, GPU drivers. It provides implementation for OpenGL, Vulkan, and other APIs. Basically, the idea of, well, the idea, the, um, the main advantage of using MESA is that it provides a front end, so anyone that wants to create a driver doesn't need to start from scratch. So it provides met, um, functionality to parse GLSL, to parse SPLB, uh, functionality related to the compilers. So if after parsing uh, the GSL and SPLB, you can you know, process it with all these compilers, uh, classic um, optimizations and, and libraries. It also handles the API for OpenGL um, and Vulkan. And in the case of OpenGL, there is a lot of um, state tracking of the OpenGL API. So if you start to define uh, vertex backtests and all the stuff, it's you know tracked internally and also the state. Lately, on the past years, um, a lot of um, functionality that was implemented for Vulkan on different drivers is being refactored and this is also a common part, and it's been decreased also to try to add something similar to the state tracker of NGL to Vulkan, but this is a work in progress. So this is the front end, and then on the back end, you will have each specific driver. There we have a list of them. Um, for this presentation, the important one is Broadcom, the Broadcom GPUs. So in the most drivers, there are um, two drivers for the OpenGL, PC4 and B3D, and in the case of Vulkan, BCD, EV. So what is Raspberry Pi? <laughs> uh, the Raspberry Pi is a series of small single board computers. Uh, the original purpose of these uh, boards was um, really uh, leaning towards um, computer science teaching, but it became a device really popular, so it expanded out of this target, and now it's also, it's also used in other uh, cases, industry, computer science uh, teaching, etc., etc. Uh, the processor is IRM, and the GPU is video core Broadcom. So in the past years, this, we have this, the, the, this timeline. Um, I'm listing here only the, what is Raspberry Pi and number, but these other devices, like the Raspberry Pi Pico, the Raspberry Pi Compute. But as you can see in this timeline, more or less each three years, there is a new device. Uh, in relation with the drivers, uh, also we have five devices. Um, for the um, Raspberry Pi 1, 2, and 3, uh, both the, uh, the renderer and the display is BC, BC4. Uh, in the case of the Raspberry Pi 4, uh, the GPU is different, is a new one, is different, is Video Core 6, but it is still used as the display, the BC4. And then they have a kernel driver for the rendering that is B3D. And now in the Raspberry Pi 5, it uses the same layout, but uh, the GPU is different. So, um, when Igalia, uh, the company I work for, uh, started to collaborate with the, the, these drivers, it started to collaborate in, for, in 2018, more or less when the Raspberry Pi 4 was announced. At that time, uh, BC4 and B3D, the drivers, were already uh, working and available on, on MESA. So when we started to work on, on this project, um, we started to work um, first um, uh, improving the driver, the OpenGL driver, and also adding extensions. Uh, so some years later, um, Raspberry Pi 4 became uh, OpenGL ES 3.1 conformant. But you know, Vulkan is the, is the new, well, the new API. <laughs> it's, around, it's now half 
five years, more or less, I think. Uh, so some years later, after you know, getting used to the driver, uh, uh, the OpenGL driver, uh, providing more extensions, we started to work on the Vulkan driver. It's I have there the Kyoto's from scratch in the sense that before we started to work on that, there is no Vulkan driver, and then there was Vulkan driver. But as I said before, one of the uh, advantages of using Mesa is that you have a lot of common things. So we were using the, the Mesa front end, and in the same way. Take into account that um, the driver is for the video core uh, GPU. Uh, we are also reusing a lot of components, like for example the definition of the hardware comments, commands, the definition of the ISI, and the compiler. So, for example, um, for the two drivers, for the OpenGL and the Vulkan driver, the compiler. What I mean, compiler. I mean the shader compiler is the same, and also uh, the simulator. Here. Are Quick timeline of the, the Vulkan driver. Uh, we started it on November 2018. Uh, I'm not going into detail because it's not the purpose of this um, presentation. But in one year, we have uh, the Vulkan 1.0 uh, conformant. And since then, we have been working on adding more uh, extensions. So it became 1.1 and 1.2 conformant, and also working uh, a lot on, on improving the performance. So here are some screenshots about the Repair P4 and some the, this is the Unreal Engine uh, demos. So, in, and now we have a new uh, toy, that is the Raspberry P5. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the GPU is Brothco. It's a new, <coughs> is the, but it's the, a new version of that architecture and it, it includes a lot, uh, several new features compared with the Raspberry P5. Uh, Raspberry P4. So, for example, it has a higher clock rate. It provides um, uh, support for more render targets. In the Raspberry Pi 4, is 4. Now we, now we can go up to 8. It includes better, better support for subgroup operations, uh, better instruction level parallelism. Uh, also, it is true that also this is improved. Also, there is more room for, for, for performance improvement. There is also a, a little more register pressure. So, we need to make some. Uh, some work in order to improve the register allocation. There is also more uh, image format supported, new assembly stations, like new, met, new instructions to, uh, to, uh, to have to, to packing instructions. So in, in that way, you have just one instruction to make a packing that in, in other cases will require several assembly instructions. And also this hardware support for features that are uh, included on Vulkan, like death clamp, death bounce, and, and etc. But the thing is that um, before I started to talk about these new uh, features compared with the Raspberry Pi 4, we need to take into account that there is a lot, in order to support all these features, uh, there is a lot of changes, uh, internal changes on, on, on the driver. So, for example, uh, in order to include more hardware commands, commands and more features, uh, several of these hardware um, packets um, uh, needed to ch uh, were changed. What I mean, uh, packets, uh, what I mean is that, for example, when we have a driver and you want the driver to do something, like for example, configure the render targets. For example, one thing that I mentioned before is that now we have up to eight render targets. So. In the Raspberry Pi 4, you configure the, the render targets in some way, and now that you have eight, you uh, configure the render targets in a different way. So when you emit some hardware packets to the GPU, now they are different. In the same way, uh, as now we have new assembly instructions, and not, not only new assembly instructions, but some of them um, changes, uh, the compiler needs to take that into account. In any case, in spite of all those changes, we started under the assumption that we needed we didn't need a new driver. Uh, I mean, I say that because, for example, from the Raspberry Pi 3, the driver is uh, the BC, BC, BC4, and for the Raspberry Pi 4 is B3D. So they didn't need a new driver, similar but a, a new total driver. But in any case, for this for this one, we started with the assumption that we will need we wouldn't require a new driver, but just having several code paths on the data that we have. So uh, we first started with some pre-work for um, uh, the thing is that for the OpenGL driver, the B3D code base, uh, it was already organized 
in a way that supported several hardware generations, but that was not the case with the Vulkan driver. So the first that thing that we, we did is reorganize the Vulkan um, code base, sorry, the Vulkan driver code base. So it could be easy to add hardware generations. And we made that work in a general way, so we already uh, sent that um, to mess upstream. Uh, the idea with this development is that even if we were focused on the support for the Raspberry Pi 5, uh, at any time that we see any change that could be um, uh, made sense upstream, we sent we sent it either uh, streams. The idea is reduce the delta, the difference between this, uh, because at the beginning um, to implement the, the support for the PP5, we were working on a downstream uh, branch, but the idea is this branch to be not really um, um, uh, too big. <laughs> and in spite of that, when we finish the support for the PP5, we have like 120 patches. So in spite of that, we were always doing the, the, the effort to keeping that, uh, that set as small as possible. And in order to avoid a lot of work revising against Mesa Main uh, at the end of the development, each week we were revising against uh, Mesa Main. So the, the first phase of this work, uh, we made that using a simulator. Um, there were there was several advantages for using the simulator, but the main reason for using the simulator is that at that time we didn't have the device. In any case, as I say, using the simulator has some advantages uh, because that means that you just you can just use your laptop to to work on the driver. But at the same time, the obviously the performance is not the same. So it was not feasible. It's not was is not really possible to use the simulator with real applications. In any case. At that point, just at the beginning of the development, uh, that was not a problem because there were so many changes that not even regular tests from uh, regular tests now in this probably this is something that I should have included in the introduction. Uh, <clears throat> the main reference uh, in, for testing is the Kronos project called CTS. That is the one that uh, that is used to to get a driver conformant. Conformant means Kronos is the institutions that define the different um, APIs. So if you want, let's say, the seal of official seal from Kronos saying this driver is conforming with our API, you need to pass all the CTS tests. But in addition to that, the, those CTS tests is, are used for, at least for all the people that work on drivers to develop their driver. But in any case, as I was saying, at the beginning of this work, even those tests was, were too complex because uh, in, in the end, it's really complex to write a, te a, a regular test without, without using a lot of features. So for example, in those tests, usually you are testing a new way to render, and then in order to see if that rendering was working, you copy back and then compare. So you are having there two things, a rendering thing and a copy thing. So at the beginning, um, we were using really simple, as much simple as possible uh, tests. For example, uh, a test that just clear a buffer and that you could just copy the buffer without using the Vulkan API, for example. And also to make that simple, we started with just one driver. Uh, in our case, we started with the Vulkan driver and it was mostly because uh, the people that we decided to put on working on this were the ones that were working on the Vulkan driver, so we have more in our heads what we needed for the Vulkan drivers. And also, as there were so many things that were not working, and we were working on really simple tests, it also, it was also we decided it was complex to um, uh, to parallel stacks in, in, with several developers. So we started first with, with just one person. So uh, the thing is that the even after the simpler tests uh, only required some hardware package updates, it, it still requires a lot of changes in the compiler. So for those tests, it was relatively easy to update the hardware packets, but then it, it required a lot of work um, on the compiler. The focus at the beginning, at this point, is getting something working. So for example, in, in the compiler, um, when you define the instructions, at some, moment, some moments there are lowerings to uh, provide some optimizations. Like, for example, 
and this GPU allows to, in some situations, to run uh, uh, more uh, two instructions at, 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 at the same time. But in order to do that, you need to take into account um, the relations between the instructions and also some hardware uh, requirements. But at that point, uh, we were focusing on getting something working. So all the optimizations, uh, well, at least most of the optimizations, were uh, disabled. And after all this work, at some point, we, we arrived to the famous triangle. The triangle. In fact, the first one that was working was a triangle with just one color, because we, uh, one of the things that this triangle has is that, as you see, you define one color per vertex of the triangle and this one, uh, this gradient between the, the vertices. So at this point, when we finally got uh, this simple test working, so we have a base, um, uh, we started to, it was more simple uh, or feasible to, to move to, to having more than of one developer working. So we started to work two people at that moment. We still, at first, we still were using uh, really small tests, uh, working by ourselves manually, just focusing on some aspects. And then at some point, we were able to move to, to use um, CTS as a reference. Uh, we kept working on that. Um, the thing is that, um, as I say, at this point, we were working with the simulator. And also, our objective was getting as much CTS tests as possible working. Uh, there are some kind of tests that, that are not really suitable for the simulator, like, for example, synchronization tests. This is because in order to use the simulator, the simulator in the end is basically a, a, a library that um, instead, uh, you, instead of calling the GPU, you are calling this library and provide some output. But in order to use that, in the end, you are using a normal laptop. So the synchronization test that requires fences and all uh, other stuff, the, it's tricky to get that working well. And as the objective is this getting working on the simulator, on the, sorry, on the real device, we usually don't try to fight too much to get in those working. So when we get a good bunch of those CTS working on, with the simulator, we ported all these changes to, to the OpenGL. Uh, that was not a lot of work because, as I say, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> the most complex part from, from this was uh, working on the compiler, updating the compiler. And the, and the compiler is common for the Vulkan and the OpenGL driver. So when we port in the changes to the 3D uh, um, to the OpenGL driver, we're more focusing on the hardware packets. After that, we re-implemented, uh, if you recall, uh, I mentioned before that we disabled the several op, uh, compiler optimizations, so we re-implemented that in order to support to be working with the Raspberry Pi 5. And at the end, uh, after that, we started to add in features uh, that were added on the Raspberry Pi 5, that so were not supported by the Raspberry Pi 4 hardware. And uh, more at that time, uh, we finally get the real device. What we received uh, was um, we have a kernel that was working, so it was bootable. So, you know, you had have the Raspberry Pi 5, you connect it, and it boots, and you could compile all the libraries. But it didn't have the, the, the GPU support, the kernel. So the first, time, the first thing that we need to do is to, to provide the support on the kernel. And doing that, we got some surprises. And first, we found um, there were also some changes on, on the signals on, on the kernel. Um, we also found some difference on, on how to handle the computer shaders. Um, th that was tricky because uh, it was not exactly as the documentation were saying. Uh, the, and, and this is more in the sense that in some cases it was like uh, the bit 32, uh, you need, we, sorry. In some cases, where something like, for example, in order to configure this, you need to do something on the bit 32, but in, in reality, it's the bit 34. So in some cases, getting this uh, feature needed some um, uh, try and test. 
and in other cases we needed to um, um, suppose what it was happening and suppose what would be the solution and asking um, uh, people from Proscon about if that theory was correct and we did that. So in this in this case the, the main problem is that sometimes we we didn't we have something that was not working and we were not sure why. So it was a lot of investigations and investigation and try and and, and, and try it. <coughs> also uh, when we reset the, the real device uh, in the case of Vulkan, testing it was not really uh, a problem because for the case of Vulkan, it was easy to run it without an X server or Wayland because uh, it was possible to run it without that. But for the case of the OpenGL and OpenGLES, uh, for the CTS, you require an X server. And, in order, and also for the desktop, you also need an X server, obviously. But the thing is that when you run uh, the X server, you need to launch it using the driver that you have and not the driver that is in, on the system. So in the end, we required uh, to build X and their dependencies and also starting the server uh, manually. That, um, that needed slightly more um, uh, manual uh, configuration that we are used to. So, um, and now uh, here, uh, a timeline of the Raspberry Pi 5. Um, so finally it was announced on the 8th on September of last year. Um, when it was finally announced, we are at that the same day we sent the, the, the code that we have to in order to be um, merged upstream. As I said, uh, even if we try to keep um, the subset as small as possible, in the end it was like 120 patches. Um, so he got some time to get the review done because um, the good thing is that uh, most of those patches um, were only touching our driver because uh, as any other uh, upstream project uh, that has support for different things, uh, if you are touching things that could affect other drivers, then the review process is more longer because you need to get involved with more people. Uh, for the basic support of the RPP5, we are only touching our driver, so we are we were the main responsibility for that. Uh, and in fact, we also try to avoid these touching things that could affect other drivers, but creating the, uh, putting those patches on a different mesh request. That was not mandatory, just a, 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 a way to implement other features. So in slightly less than one month, all that code got merged. And, and in October, the last year, uh, the RPP5 uh, was available to, be, to, to buy. And two months later, uh, our code was got from Kronos, uh, the Vulkan 1.2 and OpenGLS ES 3.1 uh, conformance. So what we are doing that uh, right now? Um, obviously, the maintainer work. This is a new driver, a new device. It has less than six months, so we are getting uh, issues created by the users. Uh, we, are we are still adding features. The good thing is that most of the work that we are doing adding features um, can be used for both the Raspberry Pi 4 and Raspberry Pi 5. And we are really near uh, to, to implement the, the, the functionality needed for Vulkan 1.3. And now for the RPP5, uh, we are uh, retaking, working on performance work. And I, I finished, I think that I was really, really fast, sorry for that. <laughs> um, so if anyone has any question. Okay, so. Um, Hello, hello. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so earlier, <coughs> sorry. So earlier you mentioned um, kind of abstracting or making common like uh, some of the infrastructure, like for example, the shader compiler. I was wondering, uh, were you making the, um, 
were you making that more abstract or are you upstreaming that infrastructure to Mesa? So now that there's like common Vulkan infrastructure within Mesa across all different types of GPUs or specifically just for your RPI efforts? Oh, okay, um, on that there are two parts. Um, as I say, Mesa is really well structured, so they, it has a front end of code that all drivers are supposed can use. So uh, on the case of Vulkan, right now, as, as I mentioned before, they are, try are making an effort because one of the things that they, they found is that in different drivers, uh, Vulkan drivers, they were, especially at the beginning, they were just copying and pasting one from one driver to the other. So on Mesa, they are doing an effort to after that. But as we are helping on that, we are not the main force on, on, from that. Uh, and then the other, the other part that I mentioned that when we started to, to create the Vulkan driver, uh, at that time we already have a compiler separate from the OpenGL driver. Uh, so just we, on, that, on that part we didn't do a lot. I mean, um, when, when we started to abstract things were from the, from the uh, OpenGL driver saying, okay, this is common, let's move to a common place. The compiler was already on, on a, um, already separate from the driver. And um, for example, the simulator, the simulator also was, this is something that was part of the OpenGL driver and we moved to a common place in order to be used. But from that part was a uh, broad common focus just for this driver. Then, um, um, I don't know if you were asking exactly about that. Or did you reply the question? Or? Yeah, you answered okay. the question, yeah. And, and now it was this. Hey, um, I'm curious how much support you ended up getting from Broadcom through all of this. Um, okay, our main collaboration with, with the Raspberry Pi. So uh, the idea is asking them only if it really needs because uh, we have access to the documentation. So um, every time that we ask, they are really friendly and they ask, they have no problem. But we, ask, we also try to not ask constantly. So if we have a problem, the or objective is fight against the problem. For example, what I said before about uh, some of the problems that we had with the kernel and we needed to guess a theory. So we were fighting our guards and we, we were, you know, trying to get a good uh, base of what is happening and what will be the answer for that problem before relying to Broadcom. So it was not, okay, this is not working. I don't know what is that. Let's call Broadcom. No, we will not go with that. We try always fight with the problem and okay. Now is the moment to, to ask them. But I mean, it's, it's a good relationship if you're asking about that. Thank you. Uh, because Raspberry Pi is used in a lot of different um, projects and is pretty ubiquitous in the DIY space. Do you have any intentions of incorporating a Collabra's GitLab CI efforts in driver testing and validation for the Raspberry Pi? CI, you're asking for the CI? Yeah, Collabra has, uh, has had several talks lately um, about uh, having CI pipeline done to test uh, well, drive, the thing graphics that drivers on the real hardware. Okay, the thing is that um, this project is, uh, the, I mean, Mesa upstream, are, is uh, the GLAB from Mesa, are where they have a, their own CI. So uh, we have a farm, I mean, uh, in fact, the, um, uh, the Raspberry Pi farm that is connected to the Mesa GLAB CI is at Galia offices. And we are, the, we are the ones that are maintaining that and and configuring that. Uh, in fact, right now, one of the one, uh, quote, problems that we have is that the Raspberry Pi 5 farm is really small. It started with just one device. For some, because I think that for the Raspberry Pi 4, on the Igalia farm, we have like 12 or 20 something. It's like a tower of Raspberry Pi 4. For, but for the Raspberry Pi 5, we only, we only have some devices because it's new. We don't have too many devices. But the idea is increasing that farm. Also, the, oh, okay, I remember. The other problem with the Raspberry Pi 5 is that, the farm, I mean, is that as the connector changes, <laughs> we didn't have the connectors and the tower, you know, because it's, you know, it's a, um, I don't know how to say, it's a rack. 
I mean RAC. So the RAC that we have for the PP4 is not compatible with the RAC for the PP5. So we need to buy that stuff, buy the RAC PP5, and connect it with the CI. Um, also, um, so from, from the point of view of the CI, we also try to be as extreme as possible. So any other one has any question? Okay, so I think that's, that's enough. Um, please power off the, okay. Okay, thank you very much.
All right, I got a green LED. It sounds like I got a microphone. Got slides. I guess we can get started. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for coming. I know it's uh, last uh, talk slot of the day. I know I'm between you and whatever's next, which has got to be better than this. Uh, but fortunately, they don't open the uh, the beer hall until 5 o'clock, so you at least have to stay here that long. Um, my name is Drew Mosley. I'm here to talk about uh, comparing uh, image update models and various updaters. So if that's not what you're here to see, I won't be offended if you get up and leave. I want to make sure you're here to you get the information you want. So briefly, just real quick uh, about me, I work for Toradex. I'm a technical solutions architect for our Torizon system. Uh, I have been working with updaters for seven, eight years now. I worked uh, for Mender for four years before working at Torizon. So I've got quite a bit of experience uh, with uh, embedded Linux and specifically, is that coming in and out? Ah, gotcha, okay. So, uh, you know, the, 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 that's kind of my background. Um, just a brief overview. We'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, the, the various OTA models, uh, specifically dual AB and o OS tree uh, are the most common. Uh, and then we'll go into, I'll talk a little bit about uh, each of the, the, the four updaters you see on the screen here, um, including so, a description of how each of them handles binary deltas. And then uh, we'll go into some benchmarks uh, for some uh, common upgrade over the air update type use cases. Uh, my slides are posted on Twitter already. They're on the, the sked.com site. So feel free to take pictures if you want. Uh, but otherwise, I've got all my contact information at the end. Uh, feel free to just come and grab them uh, from there. Uh, I kind of feel like uh, you know one of these one-hit wonders playing at the, the state fair. I know you guys are all here to see the benchmark numbers, but I'm afraid if I start with that, there'll be no, no reason for you to stick around. So we're going we're gonna to save the actual numbers till later. Uh, hopefully, uh, the details I have on methodologies and things will be at least relatively interesting to you, uh, and you know maybe uh, you'll learn something. So. Just to give an, a, an idea, Torizon is our system, and just to give some context for, for, for this talk, uh, Torizon is a full end-to-end -end system. It's the, the client OS as well as all the uh, development tools, cloud infrastructure for over-the-air updates, remote access, that kind of thing. And so the, the, the um, background for this talk really came from some customers of ours who had very uh, tight um, uh, very very limited bandwidth connections. So they're on CAT M1 connections, on mobile devices, uh, coming in and out of uh, connectivity, and um, you know. So so we're talking you know it, it, kilobytes a second is a is a good day for some of these customers. So um, that's where the, the the background for a lot of this uh, discussion of binary deltas came from. I was talking to to some other folks. Uh, who don't really worry too much about binary deltas. If you're on a big, fat, nice, reliable data pipe, it might not be worth your time to, to, to deal with the complexity of uh, doing some of these delta update scenarios. But as I mentioned, there's roughly speaking two, two uh, broad categories of updaters. One is the dual partition updater that you see here. It's just literally redundant partitions. You're just ping-ponging back and forth between them. Typically, there's going to be a, a, a data partition uh, that, is, that allows for storing your persistent data. Uh, logic in the bootloader is responsible for deciding whether you're on the A or the B partition. The updater is going to switch you back and forth when, when the time is right. It's pretty straightforward, uh, and, and a lot of the updaters use this me mechanism. Uh, but the next mechanism is a little more complicated. So libos tree, this is, you see the long description here that came directly off their website. Uh, and there's really three main uh, components to it. One is that it's a Git-like model. So if you understand how Git stores things in a repository, it stores all files in a content addressable data store, and if it, you have the same version of a file in one, in one release and the next, they actually are hard links to the same actual object in the database, you're going to be very familiar with how OS tree does it. Uh, but unlike Git, which is main, intended to store um, source code, LibOS tree is really intended to store fully bootable file system trees. Um, so you're not going to generally, I don't even know if LibOS tree actually supports the concept of a merge like you would in Git. Uh, th there may be some esoteric features in LibOS tree, but it's not something that, uh, that, that comes up in day-to-day -day usage of it. And 
uh, the third main component is it's also the bootloader configuration. So just like in the previous slide with the dual AB, when you're dealing with an OS tree based updater, uh, the, the bootloader is, is responsible for selecting the uh, appropriate configuration and the, the or excuse me, the appropriate commit to be booted at any given time. So I mentioned hard links. Uh, you know, if you're familiar with hard links, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but it's important to note that everything in OS tree is file based. It's not block based. There are some uh, systems that use like uh, ButterFS and uh, its snapshots. That's not what we're doing here. But it does require uh, that you are able to bind mount the root file system, and that's really the the, the root of how it works. Uh, there is an init ramfs that gets loaded, and it takes care of all the initialization, and it will do the, the appropriate pivot root into the, the, the proper uh, bootable file system tree. And just to kind of give the, the picture, I think this kind of really explains it. So this, the, the image on the left is the storage device. So you've got your boot directory, which has all the, the kernel, uh, all the bootloader environment information, and that kind of thing. And then you have your actual OS tree repo at the very bottom, is that's where if you look inside there, that's going to be very much like a Git repo where you see the, the directories with the, two, the, the first two characters of the commit hash and then all the objects underneath that. And then under the deploy directory, these are where you have individual commits. So in a real system, you would actually have multiple commits under that deploy OS deploy directory. Um, and then those are basically going to be hard links to objects in the repo that, that form the actual runtime directory. So let's talk about the updater. So there's really four component, uh, four contenders here that, that, that we're dealing with. Uh, like I said, I worked for Mender for four years, so I'm pretty familiar with it, although my uh, information may be a little bit out of date. Uh, the basics haven't changed. So with Mender, it's important to know that it is dual AB plus a persistent data partition. Fairly standard stuff. Uh, they do have a hosted uh, server. They also have a, an on-prem server that you can install uh, and run it yourself. It does, use, it does support standalone deployments, which is what I used for uh, capturing all these benchmarks. And basically, this is just from the device you're running Mender, giving it a URI to where the actual update artifact is stored. In my case, I just am running a, uh, a local web server, and I pull it down that way. Um, the binary deltas implemented with uh, Mender use the X-Delta compression tool. Uh, it is part of the commercial offering. They were uh, generous enough to give me access uh, for the purposes of doing these benchmarks. In, for, in Mender's case, it does require uh, that the root file system is read-only and that is completely unmodified. So the idea is that you specify what version you're going from and what version you're going to. And if that from has changed, you're out of luck. It won't work. Um, I use the default tuning values. There are additional uh, compression uh, values that you can change. I didn't mess with any of those. So your mileage may vary on any, indip any individual use case. You might be able to tweak those a little bit to get slightly better, uh, better performance, but I did not uh, go into that level of detail. So the next one up is RALC, and this one I know I've talked to a few folks about today. Um, again, dual AB plus persistent data partitions. Uh, it is compatible with Hawkbit deployment server, uh, but it also has that standalone uh, deployment, which again is what I used. I didn't bother with setting up a server in this case. And they, RALC has two mechanisms for supporting uh, adaptive or delta updates. One, they use CA sync, which is defined as a content addressable data synchronization tool. I've read some blog posts about it. Uh, I have not gone into a whole lot of depth on how it works, but uh, uh, it, one of the advantages of this particular uh, mechanism is it can be used on uh, UBI-based raw NAND flash, whereas most of the other systems uh, will not work on, on raw, raw NAND. Uh, and there is a bundle format that, that, that I use for the benchmarks here called Verity. Uh, one interesting thing about this is read-only is not required. Uh, so you can actually have a read-write file system, and your root file system may have changed. And basically the way it works is it, it, it breaks the, the disk up into blocks, sends a list of blocks over, or the checksums for the blocks, and says, hey, do you have this uh, checksum? If you already have it on the device, you don't have to download it. Otherwise, you will download it. So, in general, it's probably not going to be as efficient as a, uh, as a fully statically determined binary delta, uh, but it does give you some more flexibility should you have the need to have a system where you want to allow read-write on the, the root file system. And the second mechanism used by RALT is uh, what they call block-based adaptive updates. 
Um, it, you see here it's uh, 4K blocks with a 256 uh, SHA checksum. Again, read only not required. Very similar uh, in concept to the, the CA sync model, uh, but we'll see some of the numbers. And the, 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 there's uh, some minor differences, but uh, functionally speaking, the, I didn't notice anything uh, terribly different. Uh, SW update uh, is the next one. Again, dual AB, persistent data partition. Uh, SW update is the, the only one of these that also, as far as I know, supports asymmetric updates. The idea being you boot into an update mode and you don't need a fully redundant partition. Uh, I didn't do anything with that because my interest was when you're dealing with uh, devices in the field and you're doing fully uh, dual AB uh, redundant partitions. This is also compatible with the Hawkbit deployment server, but like the others, uh, I use the on-device web UI. Basically, you just pull up uh, a web UI pointing at a port on the device and, and drag and drop the file, uh, and that's what I was able to use for the benchmarks. And this uses an algorithm called Zchunk, conceptually similar to what I described for uh, CA Sync. Um, basically, you're, you're again, you're, you're capturing the blocks, checksums, which ones you have, which ones you don't have. It's all calculated on the device, so it's a little bit more resource intensive on the device, but uh, it does give you some flexibility if you do ha have the need for a uh, read-write root file system. And the, the last one is Horizon. Of course, this is what my day job is. Uh, this is the, the only one of the, the four that I benchmarked that is a single partition managed using uh, OS tree. Uh, I did use the Horizon Cloud deployment server, which is an Uptain compliant uh, server, um, simply because of the complexity of setting up a uh, local deployment. Uh, it's on my list to uh, be able to do some uh, things where the, I'm actually deploying from locally just for better comparison. But I figured at, at worst, this is going to uh, be a little bit slower, shouldn't really change the amount of data that is needed. Um, and, and the difference, uh, since it's a single partition, there's a couple other conceptual differences. So the, um, any, any object that is managed by LibOSTree is defined as read-only. So all those items that we saw in that diagram a few pages back, those are managed by LibOSTree. Uh, and so those will be read-only. Um, slash var generally is completely unmanaged. In, in the case of Horizon, uh, that's where we store uh, container uh, volumes and things like that and user application data. So that's completely unmanaged by OSTree. And, and Etsy is a special case. It's actually uh, read-write, but there's a three-way merge that happens when you're, when you're doing deployments over the air. Um, so it, it does give you the flexibility to modify the config files without, uh, without uh, breaking your ability to update. And it, this is also an adaptive update model, kind of similar to what we discussed uh, previously. Only newer modified objects need to be downloaded. So you've got that uh, object repository on the device. If uh, you know, between release three and four, only four files have been modified or changed, I only have to download those four uh, objects and I create that new bootable file system tree with the hard links. Um, an additional size reduction, OS tree has a feature called OS tree static updates, and this goes back to the, the customers I was talking about with the, the, the really restrictive modems. Um, typically with uh, OS tree, you're going to get fairly good speed up just by the virtue of the fact that you're only downloading new or modified objects. But if you need to go even further, uh, th it has some heuristic algorithms where it can figure out, okay, if I need to download these four objects, which objects are they closest to that I might already have and actually do a binary delta at the file level on those, fi uh, on those particular files to help reduce even further the amount of data you need to download. And another uh, big advantage uh, that, that we've noticed when you do the, when you use this OS tree static delta, it ra drastically reduces the number of HTTP GET requests that go to our server. So when you're typically, when you're doing a standard OS tree update, every object is an HTTP GET request. And so when you're using the OS tree static deltas, it's actually an archive, some kind of tar file. Uh, and so instead of, you know, thousands of, uh, of uh, individual objects being downloaded, you're actually only downloading a few archive files. So that, that also helps quite a bit reducing, uh, reducing the amount of uh, data and time it takes to do these updates. So the hardware that I used uh, was a Tordex uh, Veriden IMX8 M Mini with the Xora carrier board. You see them on uh, the screen here. Block-based EMMC storage. Um, I 
All the uh, local and standalone deployments were done just over my local area network using uh, gigabit uh, Ethernet to my to my desktop, so uh, there was no additional delays, uh, additional network delays included. Uh, for Horizon, as I said, I did use the Horizon Cloud just for simplicity. Uh, I would like to maybe revisit that in the future. And then, in all cases, uh, I used the Toradex Easy Installer for initial board installation. So I had to do some porting of uh, integrating of RALC and uh, SW Update. Mender was already integrated on the Toradex boards, and obviously, Horizon was. So briefly, the methodology that I used. I started with a standard Horizon repo manifest, uh, distros and that kind of thing. Uh, when built is a, somewhere in the 350 to 400 megabyte range, depending on exactly which version, uh, which release you're using and that kind of thing. So that's kind of my starting point. Um, I had to hack the heck out of it to get it allow me to disable OS tree, because uh, that's not really something <laughs> that, that, that our uh, setup was uh, designed to, to provide. And then I added uh, additional layers to my configuration for additional update systems, and I wanted to be able to install Chromium to have uh, some significant package that, I, that I'm uh, deploying over the air. And uh, then I had to implement Verden IMX mini support on both SW Update and RALC. And then I built what we call our Horizon minimal image. Okay, and this took a lot longer than I expected it to, but. Uh, uh, I guess, given the complexity of everything, uh, it's not terribly surprising. Then we trigger the update, and I'm using TCP dump and Wireshark uh, to measure the conversation size. You see a screenshot I grabbed uh, from, from one of them here uh, to show the amount of data that, that, that is being pulled uh, for each individual update. But the main goal was to minimize the differences between the setups. I couldn't get them exactly the same, just some of the requirements. RALC requires certain kernel configuration parameters to be set. Uh, you know, obviously, OS3 is a very invasive change. So um, the, the, the goal here is not to get exact, uh, you know, completely 100% perfect numbers every time. Uh, it's, it's really to kind of get a sense of where the systems are in comparison to each other for common update use cases. So the, the upgrade scenarios uh, that, that uh, I tested, um, the first one, no update for this. It's just the initial install of Horizon version 6.2.0 uh, for each of the, 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 uh, the four upgraders. Uh, so the first actual update, I just changed a single file in Etsy with one byte plus the Mender artifact name for uh, the Mender case uh, and did a full image update as kind of my baseline. And then the next step, I did the, a similar one byte change, and I then, then I did the, the Delta update uh, for, for that particular version. And then the, third, the, the next step was to install Chromium uh, with a Delta update. Now, this is not typically something we see our users doing. If you're going to have Chromium, it's going to be on there from the beginning. But I figured for completeness sake, I'd go ahead and, and, and do it this way. So the next thing was to upgrade Chromium. Now, this is something we do see our customers doing, uh, although typically in our case, Chromium is going to be in a container, so, uh, but we do have some users that are, are putting things like that in the base operating system. And so another one that's not terribly common is I uninstall Chromium because I just got tired of uh, something in my shared state cache uh, getting messed up and having to wait two hours for the Chromium build to finish. And the, as the last step, which is probably the most common thing that our users would end up doing, is upgrading from one uh, minor release to the next. So in this case, I just went, jumped straight from 6.2 to 6.5, uh, which happened to be uh, our latest release. And so with those, uh, the, those scenarios, I'm hoping to cover kind of the, the, the common upgrade scenarios that, that, that people will be using these uh, systems for. All right, so now we get into the real numbers here. So this is the first one. I, I should have uh, should have started numbering at zero, so this this one could actually be one, but I didn't think about that till I got to the end. So this is the full image update with um, basically a 350 megabyte image with only a one byte change. So um, in, in in all of the updaters have compression built in, that's why you're not seeing 350 megs downloaded. But you see that Mender, RALC, and SW Update are all roughly the same. Uh, they're using very similar compression algorithms. Uh, this is where Horizon is uh, with the OS tree it, it, it has quite a significant advantage. Obviously, in this case, since there's only one file and plus metadata, we're only, in this case, downloading 12 megabytes as opposed to about 130 megabytes. So uh, this is where OS tree uh, performs significantly better. So now with the Delta update, 
Uh, so this is the same as the previous slide, only now we're doing a delta update. And I had to change my uh, units to kilobytes here because Mender performed very well here uh, at 232 kilobytes. Uh, the Tryzen standard without the static deltas that I mentioned uh, is uh, about 12 megabytes, I guess. Um, and then you see the others, they're, they're, they're uh, slightly higher. And then OS tree static deltas gets that size down even further to 96 kilobytes. Okay, so now we're moving on into um, potentially more interesting things. Installing Chromium, fairly level across, not surprising. Most of these objects are going to be new, so uh, we're not going to see any, uh, any real significant changes here. Uh, but it's interesting to see that, you know, basically all the options uh, performed, performed similarly. Uh, you'll notice that, like, for instance, on RALC where we have two options, uh, it looks like the adaptive updates uh, are uh, a little bit worse in this case than the CA sync updates. Uh, I think, it, was it the other way around in the previous one? Uh, it looks like CA sync's quite a decent amount better. So you're going to have to play with this based on your actual use cases, but uh, they're, they're, they're not significantly different here. Okay, so now we're upgrading Chromium. Like I said, this is a, kind of a more interesting use case. Uh, in this case, Mender actually performed the best. Uh, recall that the Mender uh, model is fully read-only, so you're, a, you're actually completely calculating that delta offline, uh, as opposed to RALC and uh, CA sync at about you know, 130 to 150 megabytes, um, which, uh, with, with the, their adaptive update models. Uh, Terizon, the, the non-static delta you see here is about 21, 120, and then with the static deltas, we were able to reduce that just a little bit further. So, uh, again, not, uh, not significant differences, uh, but uh, in this case, Mender, Mender is the best performing of the three, or excuse me, of the four. So now we uninstall Chromium. I'm not sure how, how, how interesting these numbers are uh, since, again, I don't anticipate people will be doing this for devices in the field, but I figured for completeness sake, I'd grab these numbers. And so the last one here is when we're upgrading to uh, Horizon version 6.5.0, and the, the, the difference between 6.2 and 6.5 is three quarters, I believe, of you know, whatever changes go into the, the Kirkston branches uh, in that three quarters between 6.2 and 6.5. So that kind of gives you an idea of the time frame here. Um, and, and you see, again, Mender, Mender's, quite a bit, Mender's a little bit less than the others at about 75 megabytes. Uh, RALC, both uh, CA sync and adaptive, 115, 130 megabytes. SW update also at 130 megabytes. Uh, Terizon, 113. And then with the static deltas, we're able to reduce that down to 55. And then, so I've got here just all the data on one slide. I won't go through it all again, but uh, these are the, the, the basic numbers. You kind of get an idea of where we're going here. And so next steps here. Um, I clean up all my work and submit the board support, maybe. Uh, I haven't done full validation for things like RALC and uh, SW update on the Horizon board, so I haven't decided if it's worthwhile to submit what I have into the RALC uh, community and SW update boards layers. Uh, I do want to set up a CAS configuration for repeatability because I, I find this, uh, the way I was doing it here, there was a lot of manual steps. I did the best I could to, to get it to, uh, reasonably repeatable, but uh, if I could set up a CAS configuration, I think that would make it uh, a little bit simpler. Uh, I do want to do a blog write-up. I know my marketing team is pushing me hard for that, uh, including the update times and how long it took to do most of these updates. Um, another thing that came up, uh, there are some, uh, in the Google Summer of Code, there's a couple open projects related to Uptain to uh, uh, enhance Uptain to support dual partition updates, which uh, I guess it doesn't today. So. Uh, our, our system architect who's working on the Uptain side is, is, has been uh, uh, trying to get this information from me on how to get things like SW Update and RALC working on the Toradex hardware so that we could uh, potentially work with those summer, uh, summer code projects to uh, get that functionality into Uptain and maybe get it rolled out. And then I'd also uh, be interested in uh, other interesting update scenarios. So the con my contact information here, if you have specific uh, update scenarios that you think are interesting and want to reach out. Like I say, if you want to get my slides, they're on Twitter there. You don't need to, to, to uh, uh, go digging too hard for them. And 
I guess we've got a few minutes, uh, a few minutes for questions. If there are any, I'm, I guess I was a little quicker than I thought I'd be, but uh, that just gives us more time to get over to the, the beer bash. And we've got a microphone if anybody has any questions. Thanks for a great talk and doing uh, all that hard work for us. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, you mentioned that uh, LibOS3 does a lot of HTTP requests and you were testing on a local network. Like, What do you think would be uh, the impact on real performance in the field if the device has like a lot of latency? Because SW Update, Rauk, Mender, I'm not too sure, but I think they make like one or two HTTP requests for a Delta update. Yeah, that's that, that, that's probably true. Uh, for but for for libos tree, I actually wasn't doing local area because I didn't set up the OS tree on my server. So I actually was pulling from uh, our server. Uh, but I've got a pretty high speed data pipe to my house, so that wasn't too much of a problem. For our customers in particular that are having this issue, uh, we did note they did notice a significant improvement. Whether that was mostly due to the reduction in number of HTTP requests or the reduction of the data size, we're not sure. But uh, overall, it was significantly better for them. They, they literally had some boards that, due to going in and out of connectivity and stuff, would take on the order sometimes of several months to actually complete an update because they would just get halfway through and then lose connectivity and reboot and have to start all over. And once we actually implemented the static deltas, they were able to update most of those boards in just a couple hours. So it's, it's, it's much more reasonable in those, in those rare cases where you're on, you know, out in the middle of nowhere on a very, very low bandwidth uh, connection. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. So first, the disclaimer, I'm the one who has the other Delta update talk tomorrow morning. Um, and, and I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, great. And uh, one question about reducing the Delta size. So did you do any measures to um, make things as reproducible as possible and also avoid that you scramble up the file system when just adding one file so that the Delta still is only basically the Delta and not the whole rest of the file system? No, I didn't, I, did, I didn't dig that that deep. I mean, I had a Yocto set up, I made my change, I ran my build, I ran the binary delta tool, and I deployed the update, which is, I figure, kind of the way most of the users are going to be doing it. So uh, I didn't want to get into too much detail until yes. I at least had a baseline for comparison. Now, if there are ways to optimize it, that might be part of you know, my next talk on this. Yeah, actually, this is uh, a good starting point to further reduce the delta by making sure you really build things reproducibly. Right. Yeah, and I know uh, one, of the, one of the engineers I talked to at my company that knows a lot more about OS tree than I do, he claims that there are definitely uh, heuristic improvements to improve that static delta algorithm. Uh, right now, it's so much better than it was, but if there, there, there may be even further options uh, on, the, on the OS tree side for sure. Thanks. Uh, Maybe, maybe more general in your talk, is there, are there things that can be done in the build of the operating system, whether it's build root or, or open embedded or whatever, to improve over the air update latencies and download speeds, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, certainly reproducible builds can help. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, the, 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 the problem that we, we see is, you know, going from one release to the next, it's death by a thousand cuts, right? If you look at the, the, the amount of changes that are going into the Kirkston branch right now, you know, one quarter to the next quarter, you know, who knows what packages have changed. So, um, you know, we have talked about are there ways to reduce the amount of churn uh, that, that, that goes in at the source level to therefore reduce at the binary level. But then, then you have to decide, well, okay, but what changes don't I want to bring in for the next release? So uh, hopefully... You know, the older Kirkston gets, the less changes are going to be there. So, uh, I did, presumably, as we move further and uh, in, in down into later releases, there there will be significantly less change at the at the binary level. Thanks. Just throw the mic. <laughs> 
So a lot of what you talked about was with lib OS tree, specifically with Terizon. Is there any other um, update system that uses lib OS tree? There are some other systems for sure. Uh, I was at a talk just a little bit ago on Apertis uh, from guys from Bosch, which they use OS tree. I know there are some desktop distros that use uh, use OS tree or a variant thereof. Fedora Silverblue and all of its spinoffs, they use uh, OS tree for the base OS as well as uh, R uh, RPM OS tree to allow you to, to, to actually layer uh, package-based updates on that. Uh, there are a number of other embedded systems. I believe the Foundry's uh, micro-platform also uses OS tree. Uh, one of the things I'm actually interested in uh, that I haven't actually played with yet is the idea of using BTRFS snapshots. Uh, I gave a talk last week in Nur Nuremberg at Embedded World about immutable uh, desktop-style distros. And so Fedora Silverblue is one of them, but there's a number of, uh, of the desktop style distros that are actually using BTRFS snapshots instead of OS tree uh, for, for allowing those kind of updates. So uh, there's, there's definitely uh, a lot of interesting work being done in that area. And you know, I, I, I guess ultimately your question about OS tree probably comes down to reliability uh, versus, uh, versus dual partition. And we have not noticed any uh, significant reliability issues. Uh, it's very, very carefully designed to allow for exactly atomic updates and that kind of thing. It's all based on, you know, essentially a, a sim link that gets created at the very end of the update process to give you that 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 uh, at, uh, atomic based update. And I know Toradex is a hardware company, so I'm I'm assuming Terizon was built for their hardware. Does Terizon run on other? Hard yeah, good besides. question. Uh, so that's actually something we probably within the last six months have really started pushing. We've got an open source uh, version of Terizon uh, called Common Terizon that runs on non Toradex hardware. So we've got you know the usual suspects: Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone, uh, x86, Kimu, that kind of thing. Because uh, we do have a number of customers that come to us and they like what we have on, and they want to migrate to our hardware, but they already have stuff in the field, and they they kind of want a halfway step. So. And I can use that with your updater? Yeah, yeah, it's all, all of our Yocto layers are open source. Uh, you can use our updater. If you use our cloud services, of course, there's a fee for that. But the actual, all the, all the um, client OS and development tools and everything, that's all uh, open source. Anybody else? I hope. I hope this is not a little, I hope this is not off topic. You mentioned Uptane, so I'll ask you, uh, do you have an opinion on Uptane and what is it? Okay, um, I am not the architecture uh, security uh, guru on that. With the way I usually describe Uptane is uh, it is a, a um, system from the automotive space for deploying over the air updates to automotive systems. And if you're familiar at all with automotive systems, you know they're a lot more complicated than your typical uh, you know, embedded IoT type device. So it's basically a, set, a specification of what keys are defined, what they're used to, uh, to, to, um, to sign and verify, and essentially what attack scenarios that is intended to protect. So, um, in, you know, in, in the typical case, you would sign your artifact, and on the device, you've got a key that can verify the signature. In Uptain, it goes one step further and actually signs the entire contents of the repository. And there's all sorts of metadata and things that that, that go on, and so uh, you know the, the the problem with a single uh, key signing an artifact is if that artifact is on a USB key in a drawer and you pull it out six months later, uh, it's still going to install. Whereas the, there are mechanisms in in Uptain to make that revocation that much easier because you're actually signing the contents of the entire repository instead of just a single artifact. Uh, but beyond that, I, I, I would be lying if, I, if I, I tried to give you any more details than that. Do you have an opinion on it, though? I, we like it. Okay, cool. That's great. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, 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 I'm not the one that has to implement it. So <laughs> you know, from my perspective, uh, it, it, does, it does protect a lot of attack scenarios, which, which, which is pretty important. Anybody else? All right, well, I guess we got, I'll give you five minutes back and we can go uh, up to, I guess, the fifth floor where they, they're having the tux race or whatever the heck it is. Thank you. Thank you.